Okay. Really helps because it's a lot good, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to those of you who were here yesterday, and welcome to the new arrivals from this morning to the side event preceding the 11th European Forum on the Rights of the Child. Uh, we have a very good programme lined up for you again this morning. Um, I would just remind you to wear your badges when you're in the building, that you have the hashtag for social media on the back of your card. Don't uh, be afraid to use it. You also have the event app that you can download on your smartphone. And on the event app, given that 170 or 350 people aren't going to get to take the floor, you can also provide feedback. So it would be good if you would like to provide feedback on yesterday to use the event app, go to the feedback tab and you have two questions on the first half of the side event. We will ask TIPIC to extract um, the feedback at about half past nine. So you have a few minutes um, if you would like to give feedback and then we can, they will magically extract it. I don't quite know how. And they will uh, bring it to us so we can relay it back. If I remember well, there are also, you can also, um, raise things that you thought were missing from yesterday and perhaps then it would be an opportunity for today's speakers to cover them. So please give your feedback on the app. And um, again, we will ask all our speakers who could talk at great length about their areas of expertise to keep to their 15 minutes as per yesterday. Yesterday, our speakers were real standard bearers. They did us proud, so um, we'll try to do that again. And for the newcomers, um, you, you've seen what the aim of this event is. It's to raise awareness on the circumstances and situation of children that lead to deprivation of liberty, the effects of deprivation of liberty during and after, and we ask all of you when you go to the forum to bring that with you and beyond. So please make the best possible use out of what you're hearing today. In a way, it's all just teasers and at least then you know who experts are if you need to get more information. So let's start. First up this morning, we have Stephanie Rapp, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Child Law in Leiden University. And she is going to speak about the child's right to information in the context of deprivation of liberty. Stephanie, you have 15 minutes, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk here today to you about the right to participation and information of uh, children deprived of liberty. Um, children uh, who are deprived of liberty are uh, in a particular vulnerable position and uh, rights violations in deprivation of liberty uh, take place on a large scale. Uh, the provision of liberty can take place in various legal grounds in different systems. In this presentation, I would like to focus on uh, children who are deprived of liberty in the juvenile justice system. Um, Article 37 of the UN Convention of the right, uh, on the Rights of the Child is the core provision um, on uh, deprivation of liberty of children. Um, and uh, it recognizes um, uh, the impact deprivation of liberty has on children. Um, it also advocates for a, a child-specific approach towards children in uh, detention, for example. Um, so children are entitled to be treated with humanity and respect, um, and the special needs of children should be taken into account according to this uh, provision. Um, so it's vital that children can enjoy all rights under the CRC, and therefore a strong legal position of children deprived of liberty uh, is of importance. Um, um, when looking at the CRC, it's important to bear in mind that children can be or should be seen as, as rights bearers, 
not only children who are in need of protection, but also those who can exercise their rights uh, independently uh, and autonomously. Uh, and Article 3 and Article 12 are of much importance in that regard, so that the best interests of the child are taken as a primary consideration and that the child has the, the right to be heard. I would like also to uh, stipulate in this presentation that uh, access to justice in a way of having effective remedies um, in case of rights violations is of, of much importance for children deprived of liberty. In this presentation, I would specifically like to focus on the right to participation and uh, information. Uh, the umbrella term of participation has been uh, further conceptualized uh, for children in conflict with the law. Um, first of all, um, we have uh, the right to be heard for children in, in Article 12. Uh, so children um, have the right to be heard in all matters that affect them, and it means that procedures should be accessible to them, uh, that they should actually be able to give their views. Um, also, Article 40 is of importance in this regard because it um, um, states that uh, state parties should promote the reintegration of children and prevent stigmatization and social isol isolation, uh, which I think are very important aspects of what might happen when children are deprived of liberty. Um, furthermore, states are encouraged to uh, provide specific treatment to children in a specific juvenile justice systems. And this also uh, counts for uh, detention facilities, for example. Um, of importance to mention are, of course, the Beijing rules in which for the first time was laid down that children should be able to understand and participate in uh, juvenile justice procedures. Um, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has been very prominent in standard setting with regard to um, uh, participation in juvenile justice. The committee makes a strong link between fair trial and uh, participation during uh, trials, uh, influenced by the Euro European Court of Human Rights. Moreover, um, the European uh, or the UN Committee also makes uh, uh, advocates strongly for providing information to children. Uh, because having adequate information is a precondition for making clarified and informed uh, decisions by children, uh, which is part of their right to be heard. Um, when we look at the Havana rules, they um, give us more guidance with regards to children who are actually deprived of liberty. Um, and there are two sets of rules that are important here. Uh, first, children should be informed about the rules uh, governing the institution. So when they are um, admitted to an institution, they should be given rules in writing about how, uh, um, what the house rules are of the institution. And they should be able to help, uh, or should be helped to understand these rules. On the other hand, it's important that children are informed about how to make a complaint when uh, rights of them are, are violated in the institution. Um, and also information should be given about um, how uh, the compla complaints procedure works in that regard. Uh, the CPT standards give us further guidance with regard to information on rights. Uh, they stress the importance of giving information uh, from uh, when a child is detained in, in police custody. Um, an information sheet should be uh, provided to children preferably, which is written in uh, child-friendly uh, language. Uh, a simple and, and clear language that children should be able to understand. Also, uh, the house rules uh, should be given to children and information on how to lodge a complaint. The CPT uh, standards specifically uh, state that uh, the complaints procedure should be simple, effective and child-friendly so that it is accessible to children uh, in case they have a complaint about um, the activities or the the, the way that they are treated in detention. When we look at the, uh, the European uh, framework with regard to this topic, uh, first of all, the European rules for juvenile offenders subject to measures and sanctions is of importance to mention here, uh, because they advocate for active participation of young people um, during the activities that take place in detention. It is uh, specifically mentioned that active participation um, is also a necessary condition um, uh, for the, su the success of these activities. So young people will be uh, more motivated and better able to, um, uh, to really involve in these activities uh, when they uh, can uh, participate. Um, two other uh, EU directives are important to mention here. The Directive on the Right to Information 
specifically draws attention to um, providing information on procedural safeguards when children are involved in uh, justice procedures, um, which should be provided in simple and accessible language, specifically for children. The newest EU directive on procedural safeguards for children um, in that directive specifically the rights to effective participation is um, um, uh, adopted in Article 16. Um, however, it is only stated in light of the trial and not in other parts of the procedure. Deprivation of liberty can cause much stress and uh, feelings of anxiety, um, especially in the earliest phase, phases when children are deprived of liberty, when they are um, arrested by the police, for example, and put in, in custody. Um, it has been shown that poor adaptation to the imprisonment situation can lead to uh, risky situations where children um, experience much anxiety, uh, but also uh, involving self-harm, for example, or suicide, uh, or aggressive behavior towards staff because of their insecurity and, and unsafe uh, feelings. Um, generally, it can be stated that children who are deprived of liberty um, have uh, particular problems with accessing uh, legal assistance, uh, having contact with their families, for example, and also accessing information uh, at these earlier stages. Um, from a procedural justice perspective, we can um, say that, that people will perceive procedures as, um, uh, as more fair um, um, when they are able to uh, participate in these procedures. So the treatment they receive is perceived as more fair when they are able to, uh, to have a say in, in how these procedures are going. Um, and it has also been shown specifically for children who are um, uh, in a detention facility um, that uh, the level of aggression and feelings of loss of autonomy uh, can be reduced when uh, young people feel that they are treated more fairly. On the other hand, it's also been shown that experiencing unfair treatment um, in the detention setting relates to feelings of uh, stress and anxiety and fear. So there's a strong uh, link found between a fair treatment and adaptation of young people in uh, detention. Um, there's also been found a link between uh, this, this adaptation of young people and being motivated for the training programs that are provided. When young people do not feel uh, treated fairly um, and when they uh, feel uh, uh, much uh, feelings of stress and anxiety, they're also not motivated to participate in programs that might help them to, um, to go on the right path later, to, to reduce uh, reoffending, for example. And in general, it can be stated from, from other uh, research as well that children uh, value being able to hurt in procedures, not only detention, but also juvenile justice procedures in general, um, and that they feel that better decisions can be reached when their voice is heard as well. Um, on the other hand, it's also been shown that many children feel that they are not uh, given a mar a mar uh, enough information to be able to participate. Um, so they do not feel sufficiently uh, protected as well in juvenile justice procedures and they also uh, complain about unfriendly um, uh, professionals um, in the juvenile justice system, uh, in detention but also outside of detention. Um, they do not feel uh, respected for example. Um, to conclude, I would like to give some, uh, on the basis of this uh, talk, I would like to give some uh, directions for the future. Um, it can be stated that several aspects of adolescence uh, development, their cognitive development, makes that young people will not understand um, uh, everything, uh, ev all the information that is provided to them. Um, so that will hamper their understanding of rules and procedures, for example. Uh, this is a, a, um, a, uh, an argument for providing child-friendly information to young people, but it is very much of importance that uh, children will also truly understand uh, the information and also the consequences of the decisions that they would like to take. So uh, true appreciation of uh, what they are consenting for or deciding for is very important in this regard. Um, it's important as well that they received an adequate support and uh, help with that. And I think staff of institutions can play a major role in this to um, uh, give information to young people, but also explaining uh, the different options um, that uh, follow from their decisions, for example. And as been uh, said before, uh, fair treatment by staff can uh, diminish uh, violence in institutions and, and risky situations. 
Um, what's also of importance here, uh, I think, as a direction for the future, and this has been stated before as well by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in his report on access to justice for children, um, is that it's important that children are empowered um, with child-sensitive information uh, and also child-sensitive uh, procedures. Um, uh, so that they have effective ways of access to justice. And with regard to the detention, that really um, um, has a strong link with uh, being able to make complaints if they feel that their rights are violated and having effective mechanisms of um, putting forward these complaints and having an effective resolution to that as well. Um, what we know is that uh, providing information to children without them understanding it is, is rather meaningless. Um, so I think empowerment uh, of children deprived of liberty um, and educating them about their rights is uh, very important um, for them to be effectively able to exercise their rights. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Stephanie. And um, I think we've already linked your paper in the background reading. So um, you, you've had the link to uh, a huge long list of background reading. I think there's whatever, 500, 468 links in there, um, but lots of good things. And for our next speaker, Link number 318, um, the MDAC charm report. It won't take you more than 90 minutes to read. It would be 90 minutes really well spent. Um, it's a really, really, really compelling, well-written, easy to read uh, and harrowing report. I would ask you all to please have a look at it. So um, I'd like to pass the floor to Sarah Pastor, um, mispronounced name, I'm sorry, who is the Child Rights Project Manager with the Mental Disability Advocacy Centre. Um, and Sarah was running this EU-funded project. Um, whenever there's an EU-funded project uh, that did good work, I am really, really happy um, to make that known. I am very glad that we funded this project, as I was very glad that we funded the project that Kaloyan referred to yesterday, the um, Helsinki Committee study on children deprived of their liberty in four countries. It was a book like that, and also really, really uh, very well done and worth reading. Uh, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Margaret, for your extremely kind words. Um, let me please read my presentation because I would like to be really accurate and really detailed for Kurt. I'm Shari Pastor, I'm a special needs therapist of, intellectual disability, of children with intellectual disabilities and a cognitive neuroscientist. Currently, I'm child rights project manager at Mental Disability Advocacy Center, as Margaret mentioned. I would like to present you findings of 31 human rights monitoring visits in residential institutions of children with mental disabilities that MDAC and partners uncovered between 2016 and 17 in Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, and the United Kingdom. So this picture was taken in Hungary in April this year in a state-maintained institution and EU-funded institution 30 kilometers from Budapest. The institution is called Topaz Special Home. Some of you might have heard about it earlier this year. 220 residents are living here, children and adults mixed. Most residents have intellectual or multiple disabilities. The adults living here were often child residents of the same institution. On this photo, you can see seven male residents in a common area of one of the wards, boys and young men, who spend their days usually exactly what you see on this picture. The room is unstructured, noisy, and when you enter, it smells like urine and des disinfectant. The windows are covered by bars and nets, 
and the window handles are removed. So the windows cannot be opened to let fresh air in. Except of a few pieces of furniture, no toys, no books, no objects, no personal belongings are to find here. Residents wear training clothes, one of them a makeshift pajama, trousers soon to a mismatched top. This guy there like next to the window leaning. Um, Steph explained that they are preparing these using old and broken bed sheets. We have been to this institution five times and no organized activity mm. took place at times of any of our visits in this department. This means that young men and teenagers having to live here have nothing to do. There is zero physical, cognitive, or emotional stimulation, no education, no therapy. They are not challenged, no one is communicating with them. They are just left here for the whole day, between the meal times, logged in this word, completely neglected. In frames of the EC co-funded project Margaret just mentioned, I coordinated, a methodology was created with the current contribution of roughly 30 international experts coming from multidisciplinary backgrounds, some of them sitting here. Uh, this is the book I also put there like in the, in the side room, so please have a look. And this is called the Charm Toolkit, which is a collection of extensive information focusing specifically on the human rights violations children with mental disabilities in institutions face and the high standards way of conducting monitoring visits in interdisciplinary teams to detect these. We trained 147 professionals internationally to identify, prevent, and publish the abuse in these countries to promote rights of children with mental disabilities in institutions and to push governments and policymakers towards full deinstitutionalization. Our methodology includes communication with children with mental disabilities during monitoring visits, and we also created pictures to support this. As in Topaz in Bulgaria, we found the same. Stickers referring to, referring to EU funding, mm -hmm. serious neglect and abuse of residents. As in Topaz, when you entered, that strong smell hit you, the mixture of body fluids and disinfectants. Cupboards, shelves, beds, desks, chairs were here uniformed in all bedrooms. Windows couldn't be closed. Handles were removed. Residents had cold hands. One worker wore a white medical coat with the EU logo on it. They grabbed and pulled residents. On this picture, you can see a resident of a Hungarian institution locked in her bedroom with a wooden gate which only staff can open. She is not allowed to leave the room unless a worker decides so. All the monitored residential institutions are considered as places of detention because children cannot leave these freely and are placed here on a discriminatory basis because of their disabilities. Hundreds of thousands of children live in institutions Europe-wide and children with mental disabilities are overrepresented. All countries in our research, again Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary and the United Kingdom, lack of support services for individual care in families and of inclusive education. And this is what validates these European states in 2017 to detain their children, discriminate and segregate them, and often force families to put their children in such places because of the lack of alternatives provided. In several cases, local states denied access to institutions for our independent monitoring teams. To top has, we were seeking access for half a year on an ongoing basis. We wrote letters to maintaining authorities, organized meetings, seek constant cooperation, even tried to access the institution once with a Hungarian member of parliament as their professional team. Although access was always denied for independent experts. The pictures I would like to show you in the following are all made in this institution in top has between February and April this year. On this photo, you can see a male resident lying on a bed in a curved position with his shoes on. He's covering his eye, the light might disturb him or he wants to be disconnected since there is nothing he could connect to. He did not stand up when we came closer to him, did not show any interest. The lack of individual care leads to neglect in his case. 
his cognitive, emotional, and physical needs are obviously not served. If children are not communicated with, if they are not challenged, if their nervous system does not receive sufficient stimulation for a long time, they start to stimulate themselves in various ways, to stimulate their nervous system, to perceive stimuli and show a behavior a response to that. If children have no education, no programs, no hobbies, I need to speak slower, no friends, no visitors, no books, no toys, no personal objects, no pillows on their beds, no children, and adults around they could communicate with, there is nothing left than to start to stimulate themselves, to feel their own bodies, or to stimulate the environment to connect to. Typical behaviors experienced in those institutions that seriously neglect their residents are often so-called self-stimulative behaviors, as rocking, biting on their own hand, hitting the, hitting the own head, pushing on own eyes, inadequate masturbation, chewing on clothes, papers, objects, while others might act violent to towards peers because of the extreme boredom and deprivation they live in. We saw all these behaviors in Top House. And once producing these behaviors, and again, I would like to emphasize that this is because of the neglect they suffer from and the psychological consequence of restrictions, not because of their mental disabilities. As such behaviors appear, the institution gives them even more medication or restricts them in other ways that they are less active and less aggressive. On this next picture, you can see a self-stimulative behavior, a man chewing on the wooden frame of his bed. At one visit, we found him with his face down on his bed, and as we went closer, we discovered that he's biting on his mattress that already had a head size hole in it. Next to the psychological neglect, he clearly suffers from physical neglect as well. His contractures in his body are extreme what might be pretty painful as well, despite of hindering him in movement on his own. Who knows when this person had physiotherapy last time and whether he had it on a regular basis at all. On this next photo, you can see a boy with Down syndrome who sat right at the entrance of the corridor as we entered. After we left the same ward, circa 30 minutes later, this boy sat in the same chair in the same position. His body is curved and contracted, and he's very skinny. The clothes he's wearing looked also as a home suit pajama and nappies underneath. I do not even want to guess how often his nappies are changed. His head was full of wounds, fresh ones and older ones, obviously untreated. In his right ear, we saw some thick black material that had the te texture of caviar, Maybe it was eggs of some insects. We could not find out. The woman on this picture shows the signs of malnutrition as well. She was sleeping deep during the whole time of her visit at 11 a.m. in the morning. She has short hair, as all other residents who lie in bed. This way is probably the easiest for staff to take care about their hair hygiene of residents. As we went closer, we realized that her face is injured and that she is tied to her bed with some textile piece, maybe stockings. And the psychological neglect, neglect is, of course, unquestionable here and neither on the next pictures. On this photo, you can see a female resident in her early 20s, again with short hair, sitting in her pajamas at the bottom of a 150 centimeter tall cage on a dirty sheet. As I went close to her bed, so that her eyes are open and I tried to have a conversation with her. I said hello several times, asked her how she was, introduced myself. She did not look at me even once, did not even bother that I'm standing next to her cage. She did not move, just sat in this position there in the corner. <coughs> I asked the staff member why she is in a cage bed 
And they responded that because of her epilepsy, that she does not hurt herself when having seizures. I expressed my concerns to the staff member that she would probably hurt herself more falling in a metal frame. The worker agreed after a short while. It also turned out that she is having not more than a few seizures per month, but is trapped in a cage only for that reason. In this video, I would like to show you the child in the most concerning situation, suffering from complete neglect and physically restrained in a makeshift straitjacket. His hands were tied, probably and underneath the straitjacket again. As you will see on the video, he slowly moves his hands and tries to break free, but cannot. Why is he like that? He stood like this, barefoot in the middle of the room, with the blue helmet on, his face underneath, full of wounds, face bones and teeth deformed, eyes slightly open. We could not get in contact with him either. He was made completely isolated in his body. His movement is very slow, not typical for a 12 years old. He is suspectedly over-medicated. And next to all this, psychological neglect again. No activity that would involve him, nothing to pay attention to, nothing to do. His only activity is to stand in the middle of the room and be tied. On this last picture, you can see a man in his early 20s, a resident of the same institution for 10 years, a former resident of a psychiatry hospital. He is separated from his family since he was four years old. He spends all his life in deprivation of his liberty and physical restriction. As you can see on the picture, he is tied to the metal frame of his bed with a textile strap and a proper metal lock locking the strap around his ankle. There is nothing in his room but a metal bucket for his urine and stool and a few plastic dinosaurs in a box under his bed. He is allowed to leave his room once every day when he goes to shower. Workers are afraid of him because he is tall and strong, so they better keep him tied and medicated. He is used to being tied that much that he sometimes asks the workers himself to tie him. When I was asking him whether he wants to leave the institution, whether he wants to move somewhere else, he responded with a clear no. He cannot imagine how it is to not live on the cold floor of a five square meters room tied to a bed. This is the only thing he knows. He does not know the difference between in the institution and outside because all he knows is inside. As he spotted my cell phone in my hand, he said that he wants to have one as well. I asked him whether he knows where to get one. He said, sure, in the shop. I asked him now whether he wanted to go to the shop and buy a phone for himself, and he said yes. So he does want to leave the institution and go out. He's just not permitted to do so. He's detained. So what has MDAC done? We published a report that reached six million Hungarians. Hundreds of articles were out, TV and radio interviews. We raised the awareness of the whole Hungarian society. We also reached out to international media platforms, including Channel 4, New York Times, and the Daily Mail published our report. Our international advocacy work in the last six months covered a side event in the UN and the presentation of findings of all four European countries in the European Parliament. MDAC currently has to face uh, reprisals for its work. We were sued, and the Hungarian Data Protection Authority has also initiated investigation against us. Since the publication of the Topaz report, which was six months ago, we still do not have any update from the Hungarian government on how the residents are doing and whether any steps are being made to urgently help them. The UN Voluntary Fund of Victims of Torture is funding our next steps now to provide emergency assistance to the victims and to litigate on their behalf. Unfortunately, we do not have access to the institution. The maintaining authority is denying access. 
again. With these pictures, my intention was not to shock you, but face you with the reality of large-scale institutions of children with mental disabilities in the European Union today. These children would need inclusion in the community, a caring family, free movement, access to education and to their rights as any other child. Their detention needs to be ended and we need to establish urgently alternatives for living. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Please, um, let's have lots of outrage and lots of action. Um, I'd like to pass the floor to George Malher, who is the Chief Executive Officer of LUMOS, on, again, on the situation of children in institutions. Well, um, thank you so much, Sarah, for that very powerful uh, presentation. Um, I want to take us back, actually, 28 years ago this week. Um, I don't know how many people in the room. I think there are some people in the room like me who will remember well um, that extraordinary moment when the Berlin Wall came down. For so many of us who had been raised, uh, who had been born after the, world, after the wall went up, we had known nothing else in our continent but a divided continent and half of it in the block of red in our geography textbooks. We didn't really even know. We vaguely knew the names of countries like Romania and Hungary and Poland and Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia as was. But it was a block of red that had disappeared at the end of the Second World War and then once the wall went up, it seemed as if it would be closed forever. When it came down, I think most of us found it almost impossible to believe that it had happened. Um, and we were all euphoric, um, really, with the revolutions that spread across Central and Eastern Europe and spread peacefully. We imagined that there was this transition to democracy that would happen rapidly and would change everything forever. Of course, it hasn't happened rapidly. But the reality is there has been very significant progress in 28 years, and the EU has played such an extraordinary role in healing our continent, in bringing together the countries that were divided, and in strengthening and supporting democracy and the development of democracy, even at a time as we see tides of nationalism sweeping across our continent, it is actually the EU, certainly from my perspective and from our perspective as an organization, that, that keeps that flame of democracy alive. But what does democracy actually mean? And what does a move away from authoritarianism mean? And we may all remember that uh, along with the euphoria, very quickly uh, in the very late 89 and early 90s, we started to see some of these images, which sadly we can still see some similar images today. Um, and I'm sure people remember the pictures from Romania and just quite how shocking some of these images were to us at the time. We found it almost unbelievable. They were almost indescribable to imagine that children were being kept in these kind of conditions. And it seemed like something that belonged to science fiction or to a bygone age. That was, this was 1989 in Romania. Um, and there were so many shocking things that happened in the institutions in Romania. And I, I'm not just going to focus on Romania, but it was the one that, that came out that all of us were, were shocked by. I think less of us realized that the same thing was happening, perhaps not on quite the same scale, across the whole of Central and Eastern Europe. And we find that whilst these institutions purportedly were set up to care for children, it's called the child welfare system, it's called protection, it's called care, that what happens once you place children in an institutional environment, very much as Sara was telling us, is that the regime itself, the needs of the institution take precedence over the needs of the children. The staff have a particular set of things they have to do each day, and you may have one member of staff looking after 20 kids, and so, and sometimes 40. Um, and they develop approaches to looking after the children that 
ultimately are degrading, are humiliating, and at times are torture. <coughs> this is an institution I was involved in closing in 2001-2002 in northwest Romania, and at the time it was considered still the country's worst institution. There were 270 children and adults with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, some with physical. And every couple of months, the kids were lined up to have their heads shaved, allegedly to control lice. And we would see the children at the back of the queue getting more and more distressed as their turn was coming, because if you were at the back of the queue, by the time you got to the front of the queue, the razor was getting blunter and blunter, and we would see the cuts in the children's heads this was a painful, humiliating, degrading process. And, and yesterday, Ellen talked to us, to us about her experiences of dehumanization. And it's amazing how many institutions across the world in how many countries use this head shaving. And they say it's because of controlling lice, but ultimately it really is about dehumanization. And Angus was talking yesterday about how difficult it is for kids to complain, how, how less credible they are when they're in a uniform and. Uh, and, 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 you know, when you see the children who are half naked and whose heads are shaved, the vulnerability of these kids, um, the challenge for us to see them as individual human beings, and the challenge for them to assert themselves as individual human beings in that environment, it's, it's almost impossible. So these processes that people say are about running the institution, they're about hygiene, they're about, con they're about controlling lice, are really about othering the children. You know, they're about us creating this excuse for why we're doing this to kids. When I wor walked into my first Romanian orphanage in 1993, I'd been working with children for, for about two years at that stage, and I'd been told that there were 550 kids under the age of three. So anyone who knows anything about little children would imagine, as I did, that this would be absolute chaos and it would be, there would be so much noise and screams and what have you, and it was utter silence, and I literally thought a joke was being played on me. That how is it possible to have 550 children under the age of three who were completely silent? But that's actually what happens to kids. Those of us who know about attachment and what have you know that within a couple of days of children lying in institutions, newborns lying in a cot in an institution, they've actually stopped demanding, they stop crying because nobody comes to meet their demands. And this is why it's possible to have that silence. And that lack of stimulation, that neglect, then results, as we know, in the, in the self-stimulating behaviors that, again, Shara was talking about, the rocking back and forth and so on. And quite often, then, that will turn into self-harming. And I've seen 12-month-old babies smacking their heads against bars of cots, smacking themselves in the faces, doing this. You saw some of these behaviors, um, the pictures of the child doing this. We see children trying to protect themselves from the environment, out, environment outside them because the environment is so terrifying that they're living in. So instead of that stimulation that they should be getting from, instead of that interaction with other human beings around them, they're closing themselves off into their own world because it's their way of surviving. But this means the brain is not developing, the personality is not developing, and as we see, the body doesn't develop properly either. Um, can anyone guess where this image is from and when it was taken? Anyone like to hazard a guess? It could be Romania, couldn't it? It could be Hungary. This is actually the United States of America in 1987. So whilst we were all shocked and outraged in 89 when we saw what was coming out of the institutions in Central and Eastern Europe, Willowbrook had only closed in 1987, and Willowbrook had, was allegedly a residential special school. It had 6,000 kids and adults with disabilities in New York State, one of the most terrifying places imaginable, but it took till 1987 to close it down. And then two years later, we saw the images from Romania and the entire world was shocked. We forget our own histories very, very rapidly. And this is a picture that actually sparked Lumos. Um, and this is the child in a cage bed in the Czech Republic. And as we see, still cage beds being used um, in Hungary today. We see them in Greece. We see them in other parts of the world. I've seen them in Haiti. I've seen them in Colombia. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the process of institutionalizing children, allegedly with the intent of care and protection, and welfare 
ends up with all of the classic traits of detention. It ends up with depriving children of their liberty to the extent that we actually put them in cages, that we tie them up, that we use psychiatric medication to control their behavior because once you've got these big groups of children and once some of the challenging behaviors that are a result of institutionalization start to appear, we then have to control that behavior further. And so we do that through caging children still in Europe in 2017. Um, I think I'm showing this image because I, you know, you always feel like you're seeing everything. And then last year there was this article that came out of the detention center in Australia, where again, the logic of control of behavior allows us to think it's okay to do this to kids, to tie them to a chair and put a spit hood over their head. Now I worked in residential care a long time ago and it wasn't a great residential care facility back in 1991 in the UK. There were only six kids there and there were three members of staff on duty at all times and you would think that that would work very well. But these were kids with challenging behaviours, teenagers with challenging behaviours and there was young, one young man who spent his entire life spitting and he would eat chocolate on purpose so that he could spit brown spit all over you. It wasn't pleasant but we didn't do this to him. Not even in 1991 were we doing this. So what is it that makes us think that this is okay to do to children? Another really common result of institutionalization is very high mortality rates. And people probably saw this uh, news coming out of Ireland last year of a mass grave of about 800 babies and infants. Thank you. In, in Toom in the west of Ireland. Um, and then very recently, a couple of months ago, there was a report from Scotland showing us another mass grave there. I've come across a mass grave recently in an institution in Haiti where in order to attract volunteers, um, institutions in Haiti and in many countries in the global south are set up precisely to bring volunteers who bring donations because lots of young people from wealthy countries want to volunteer in orphanages. It's part of the gap year experience and it's become trendy and it's bringing so much money in that orphanages get up, set up just to provide that volunteering experience. Can you imagine it? And then they bring the kids in because once you've got an orphanage, you need children. So they pay child finders and the child finders go out in the community and they trick parents into giving them their children and the children end up in the institution so that someone can come and volunteer and bring a donation. Um, in order to get as much money as possible, um, they will sometimes systematically starve the children. Um, so they have pictures of emaciated babies to put up on the internet and say, please come and help our poor starving orphans. And in one such orphanage, we found a mass grave recently in Haiti. We've come across mass graves in Bulgaria. I've come across them in Romania. Again, this is not about one country. This is about what happens when we think it's okay to detain and deprive children of their liberty en masse. Um, why do children die at a high rate in institutions? Well, there's much higher levels of violence in institutions, but particularly children with disabilities. What we find is that um, Again, the way that the regime is run, the regime of an institution is run, means that children with disabilities often are not given enough time and support to eat properly. And this is why in Bulgaria six years ago, um, it was found that there were very high levels of mortality in the, dis in the disability institutions, all of which have since closed, thankfully. Um, and um, uh, we sent in an expert at the request of the government to respond to the worst institution. She started by observing mealtimes. Every member of staff had, twen had 30 minutes to feed 20 kids. This meant that uh, on average, each child with disabilities, with eating and drinking difficulties, was being given one minute, 20 seconds to eat their meal. And then we wonder why they're dying of starvation. And in the residential special schools, the residential schools, sorry, for ind indigenous First Nation children in Canada, um, in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, one in every 25 kids died in those schools. If you were a Canadian soldier serving in the Second World War, you had a better chance of surviving than you did as an indigenous child in a Canadian special, uh, residential school. Um, 
I'm going to just flick through these ones, but I wanted to briefly show you there are things we can do about this. And whilst um, Sara has shown us some shocking images of what has been happening, still happening today in Europe, there has been a dramatic change over the last 28 years on our continent. There has been a dramatic reduction of the number of children institutionalised. And the EU, um, several years ago now, changed its regulations to stop funding improving orphanages and instead to transform services and to set up um, community-based health education and social services, which will eventually mean that on our continent there are no more children in institutions. We will stop doing this to our kids. But it's important that as a, as a, as a, as a continent and as a, as a grouping, that what we also do outside Europe, if we don't think it's good enough for our own children, it's not good enough for any children to be in institutions and to be deprived of their liberty. So we need to make sure that everywhere we spend money, we ensure that um, places like Mygoma in Sudan, where the mortality rate in this baby institution was 82%, <coughs> but we turned it round completely and managed to set up um, foster care and local adoption and prevention services and managed to decriminalise being a single mother which meant that babies are no longer abandoned on the streets and it's possible for kids to stay with their families. It is actually possible to transform systems of care and to do this globally. It's important as a union that we, that we do this together and wherever we spend our money we say that child welfare, child protection cannot mean detaining children, locking them up, putting them in institutions. It means family-based care, it means community support services. And I just wanted to say that even in some of the most difficult of circumstances, and again, I was involved with this in Sudan, uh, with escaped Lord's Resistance Army child soldiers, children who had been kidnapped by the LRA, um, and then uh, had escaped and found their way to Khartoum, were put in an institution there, had terribly difficult behaviours, and actually we helped them. We helped UNICEF and the government set up foster families for these kids. Within days of them moving into foster families, the challenging behaviours had all disappeared, and the kids started to realise and remember what it meant to be in a family, and to remember their own families, and then to start talking about them. And it made it possible then for us to actually trace the families in Uganda and get kids back home. So even with some of the most challenging, children with the most challenging um, pasts imaginable, um, it is possible to provide family-based care and to support children to live in the communities. It's amazing to see the resilience and the transformation of kids once you get them out of these circumstances. And we're currently working right now with UNHCR in Ethiopia. This is Endebaguna Detention Center, where children who come from Eritrea across the border end up together with adults. It's an outrage of a place. Um, we've heard many things about it the last couple of, the de of days, but we're working with UNHCR to set up an emergency foster care program based on the one that was set up in Sudan. So the Sudanese and the Ethiopians are learning from each other um, in order to make sure that unaccompanied refugee children uh, from Eritrea and Ethiopia can also be placed in families and that we can stop putting them into these shocking places where we know they are subject to rape and to all forms of abuse and, and, and just terrifying traumas uh, which just compound what they've already been through. Um, I, I mentioned briefly Haiti. This is one of the institutions that uh, people came and volunteered in. We've closed this one down um, and, uh, and, and just shows you how shocking and terrible the conditions are allegedly set up to care for children to make it possible for volunteers to come and donate. This was their living room. Um, and when we had a look at the money, we found $100 million dollars going at least, going into orphanages in Haiti every, um, every year. And that would actually, that's for, that's for 30,000 kids, but that would put more than 700,000 children in school. It's more, it was 130 times the government's child protection budget, and it was more than the um, EU puts into its entire aid program in Haiti, and it was half what the US puts into its entire aid program in Haiti. So the money that's being poured into these appalling institutions for children could do so much good if we were doing the right thing with that money instead of allowing it to go into the pockets of traffickers. Um, and I'm, I'm going to run through these very quickly just to show you that the different forms of care in institutions and in families in Haiti, in Bulgaria, in the Czech Republic, 
in Moldova. We see it consistently across the board. It costs a lot less per child to look after them in a family, including for children with disabilities, than it does to put them in these terrible, poor quality institutions. So there is literally no excuse. We have got to start spending this money differently. 28 years after the wall came down, what are we doing in Europe? When we are turning it round for our own children, for the children who are citizens of Europe, and when we are transforming systems of care, we're starting to build walls again for the kids, to keep the kids out that we are othering today, the refugee and migrant children. We need to make sure that our systems of child protection across the union are not about detaining and depriving children. And I've got four quick recommendations for the EU. The first one is, and I think that Sarah's uh, presentation brought home very clearly why we need to do this. We need to make sure we continue the implementation of the European uh, Structural Investment Funds um, rules and end institutionalization of children in the European Union. It is completely unnecessary. We know what the alternatives are. We can afford to do it. The money is there to make the change happen. We must pressure all of our governments to make sure that's the direction we're going. The second thing that we need to do is make sure that every EU member state that's receiving refugee and migrant children includes them in their child protection system and does not look after them in their refugee system. As soon as a child is on our territory, they have the same rights um, as every other child on that territory. They should be looked after by the child protection system, not by the refugee system. They should be, never be detained with adults. They should never be locked up. Um, we need to make sure that all of our EU funding, DEVCO, humanitarian aid, etc., um, ends institutionalization globally and that is co policy coherence so that everywhere as a body that we are spending money, we're spending it on family-based and community-based services that stop depriving children of their liberty. And the final and the most important message I would like to send today is that the EU that has taken a lead over this last quarter of a century in transforming child protection systems, in, in tackling this terrible deprivation of liberty that we've had in so many institutions across our continent, should take the lead on funding the global study on children deprived of liberty and encourage other member states to do so. Because if we don't make it a priority globally, clearly no one else will. I want to leave you with one final thought. And that is that it's no coincidence that the Nazi regime and that the Soviet Union used the mass deprivation of liberty of children as a way of controlling society. The T4 program, the Nazi T4 program, started by insisting that parents of children with disabilities place them in the institutions and then turned those institutions into extermination centers. So the so-called euthanasia program started with babies and children. They were the easiest ones to kill. And the staff, the personnel from those extermination centers who became inured to killing children, for whom this became a normal thing to do, those were the staff who were then transferred to Sobibor and Treblinka to, to run the extermination camps that killed millions of Jewish people and others. And in the Soviet Union, it became habitual to lock up the children of um, the undesirable parents. So politically undesirable parents went to the concentration camps and next door to the camps they set up the orphanages for their children. And kids with disabilities, again, were warehoused and left to die because they were seen as undesirable. If we, if any country starts to go down the road or de uh, of mass deprivation of liberty, mass detention of children, whatever it calls it, however it normalizes it, that is the road to author authoritarianism. And at a time when we are seeing democracy under threat, we must see this as the canary in the coal mine. So anywhere we start locking children up again, this has to be a sign to us that there is something wrong with our democracy. For democracy to flourish in the EU and beyond, we need to liberate the kids. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Um, there'll be plenty of time for a discussion in this session, so I was happy to allow a few extra minutes here and there. Um, I'd now like to pass the floor to Rachel Brett, who is a member 
of the Children of Prisoners Europe Network and has worked over many, many years on the, uh, around the issues of um, children with parents in prison. Uh, Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a bit hard to follow some of this, but um, one of the things I'm going to do in this presentation is after giving you a bit of information about children of prisoners in general, is actually to look at some of the links to the things we've been hearing. And in talking about children of prisoners, I'm using the word prisoners and I'll use imprisonment not only to cover prison following sentencing, but all detention in relation to the criminal justice system. So pre-trial, during trial, after trial and before sentencing, as well as actual imprisonment on sentence. How many children are affected? Um, simple answer, we don't know because nobody collects the statistics. But in order to have a picture, the COPE itself, Children of Prisoners Europe, has produced a, an extrapolation using the world prison brief. So that collects the number of prisoners um, and using a, an assessment of the number of children of prisoners. And this is very much an uh, extrapolation. So it is not an accurate figure. But in the Council of Europe, the estimate is 2.1 million children every day. That's a daily figure, not an annual figure, not a figure of how many children have been affected by parental imprisonment, and not a figure, of course, that includes how many adults were affected by parental imprisonment when they were children. Within the EU, that figure is, again, an extrapolation, 800,000. So we're actually talking about a large number of children in every single country in Europe. Of course, every single country in the world, since every country has some form of criminal detention of adults. What's the situation of these children? You actually have two different groups. Most, but not all, European countries have provision for babies and young children, infants, to live in prison with their mother or, in a few cases, with their father. And if you're interested in that within Europe, the Fundamental Rights Agency actually has a table in its report on immigration detention of children, but actually these are as a, as a table in relation to the criminal detention of the parents. But don't be misled by that, because that doesn't mean that all mothers of babies and young children, or in the cases of fathers, in those few cases, can have their child in the prison with them. Very often this is not the case, very often it does not appear to relate to any assessment of the best interests of the child. I was struck by Georgette's comment of the needs of the institution take precedence over the needs of children. And that's very true in prison systems for adults. And of course, in some cases, that is correct. In closed prisons and in closed male prisons, would you really want children, babies, and infants to be there. Throughout most of Europe, the age limit is around three years or less, but in fact, in some European countries, it's actually uh, permitted for rather older children. But that means that even that for those who do accompany their parent into prison or are born when the parent is in prison, many of those will actually overlap with the larger group, which is the children who are separated from a parent in prison because many of those who were in the prison with their parent will actually have to leave prison before their parent leaves prison. So the overwhelming majority of that 
2.1 million estimate in the Council of Europe, are separated from their imprisoned parent. And let's just remind ourselves that the Convention on the Rights of the Child to which all countries in the Council of Europe and almost all countries in the world are parties actually says the child who is separated from their parent, they shouldn't be separated unless it's in their best interest, but if they are, then they have a right to maintain direct contact with their pa both parents. So a child's right. What happens to those children who are separated from a parent? Well, obviously, they may be cared for by another parent, other relatives, or in go into care, foster parents, or institutions. But again, we actually don't know how many children are cared for in these different ways. More of what we do know is that more of those whose father is in prison remain with their mother, while those whose mother is in prison are more likely to be cared for, not by the father, but by other family members or informal carers or through the state care. And that's not simply a social or attitudinal question, that is also a question that more mothers who go into prison are single parents. And were usually the sole or primary carer of their child before they went into prison. And of course, both parents may be in prison. In addition to this general picture, it is important to pick up a couple of things that came up yesterday, that children in young offender or juvenile detention facilities may also be parents. And that second, within Europe, there are particular issues about Roma and travelers who tend to be overrepresented in the prison systems, as well as often in other institutions, um, and in particular, overrepresented in juvenile and youth offender facilities. Given that within these groups, in very broad brush terms, there is a tendency for early marriage and childbearing, that means that again, you are more likely to have more children from these groups disproportionately affected in this way. So what's the impact? One, the children of prisoners has now been recognized as a vulnerable group by UNICEF, by the EU, thanks largely to Margaret and the work of the EU in this. And now we welcome very much the recommendation from the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, which is due to be adopted in January, of a new recommendation about children with imprisoned parents. And they have a very good background paper on this as well, which is in the list of resources. Well, we might have to recognize that for a small proportion of these children, the removal of the parent may in fact be beneficial. But a consistent finding of research is that having a parent in prison is generally negative for the children, that as a group, they're at significantly greater risk of suffering multiple adverse effects unless provided with support. In addition from the actual separation from their parent, these may include economic difficulties, particularly, of course, if it's the breadwinner who goes into prison, but in fact, there are economic difficulties of that derive from the imprisonment because families tend to have to pay out much more to visit and to support those in prison. Loss of housing, family breakdown, stigma, and mental health problems. And in the coping research that was funded by the EU, in three of the four countries studied, 25% of the children were at greater risk of mental health difficulties than their peers, and in the fourth country, it was 50%. Although each child, even within the same family, is an individual and will have a different experience in relation to parental imprisonment, 
and therefore must be considered individually, the broad overview is physical and emotional separation. Um, and it is quite clear that actual detention or imprisonment has a more negative effect than non-custodial alternatives. For the babies and infants, the loss of breastfeeding and opportunity for mother-child bonding, so important in those early years, and the attachment when the case of the mother being imprisoned, unless, of course, they accompany her into prison, the stigma faced by children of criminals, in particular if it's high profile or notorious or even in the local community. But even without this, attitudes tend to expectations that the child will follow in the parent's footsteps, the withdrawal of friendship, the attitudes of teachers, police, neighbors, etc. Impoverishment, I've already mentioned, the likelihood of change in the caring arrangements, including having to move house, move school, going into care, or even when these don't change, the increased stress on the other parent or carer impacts on the child. And of course, separation from the parent by imprisonment may also lead to siblings being separated. And it quite often, in fact, leads to permanent separation of child and parent. Even if that wasn't the intention by the caring arrangements for the child, the parent who comes out of prison may not be able to regain custody of the child uh, for either legal or accommodation reasons, etc. And the studies suggest that parental imprisonment can increase a child's likelihood of becoming an offender, but that positive responses can mitigate this by aiding well-being, attitude, and attainment. Many of the behaviors and factors reported by children of prisoners, including anger, truanting, and lack of social ties, are recognized as risk factors predicting antisocial behavior and offending. And finally, in this section, the negative impacts of parental imprisonment do not end when the parent is released. I've already mentioned the fact they may not be reunited with the child, but the emotional, economic, and social stresses and strains of the imprisonment may continue post-release. So, links to other areas. Some children, as I said, are living in the prison with a parent, so that's the sort of direct deprivation of liberty, although they are not technically deprived of their liberty, but they are living in a prison. Some children of prisoners live in institutions. This may be directly linked to the imprisonment. So the parent goes into prison, the child goes into care, in, in this case, in institutional care. It may be indirectly linked. The increased poverty, for example, the lack of adequate housing, the inability of the other parent or carer to provide for the child can lead, therefore, to institutionalization. It may be related to underlying circumstances, so addiction or domestic violence, which may lead the parent into prison, may also be factors in the child being institutionalized, or it may be completely unrelated. But we do not know how many institutionalized children have a parent in prison. And given one of the key findings from the coping research was the benefits for children of maintaining contact with and visiting their imprisoned parents, except in the specific cases where it's not in their best interests, how are children in institutions informed and enabled to do this? And I suspect we can guess the answer, but we don't know. Both practically and with the kind of um, psychological and emotional support that they need. I've mentioned the link to young offenders. I've mentioned the overrepresentation of Roma and travelers. So the pathways. 
Babies and infants who accompany a parent into prison are direct, directly deprived of their liberty by parental imprisonment, although not being separated from the parent may be better. It does give rise to other concerns about the facilities, etc., in the prison. The negative emotional, social, and economic impacts and care arrangements for children separated from their parent lead to those vulnerabilities and risk factors, um, and the institutionalization with the knock-on effects of institutionalization. A quick word on the specifics, some of the specifics about Roma and travelers. Amongst the reasons for overrepresentation in prison populations are uh, the over-policing, stop and search operations, in increasing the likelihood of ending up in the criminal justice system, the difficulty in claiming state benefits, for example, in an ability to demonstrate the right to reside in accordance with the European Union directive on this and fulfilling other conditions, which increases the likelihood of poverty and antisocial behavior, such as begging, leading to arrests, unpaid fines, etc., etc. Um, and, of course, the whole problem about being one of the most excluded and marginalized populations in Europe. And the fact that all these factors tend to mean that they are less considered appropriate for alternatives to imprisonment, both before, during, and after trial, and for early release. Yes, there are things we can do. Obviously, alternatives to detention and imprisonment. Taking account of the best interests of the child when considering detention or imprisonment of a parent or carer, the Committee on the Rights of the Child is consistently recommending this to states, but in the first instance, many of those taking those decisions are not even aware that the person has children. They need the information, they need to consider what is going to happen to them. And many of them are very resistant to the idea that this is a relevant consideration in sentencing a parent, in sentencing an adult. The importance of helping the child to maintain that contact with the parent. And I can't stress this enough, that it really does seem to be crucial if you're going to do this. Facilitating that contact, the question of financial support as well as physical, emotional support, and a, another, another accompanier if the parent is not able to be, or the carer is not able or willing to accompany. And don't forget, we're talking about those who are not only in their own country of origin or normal residence. These may be foreign nationals as well as being uh, in prison, and the children may be either in that country or another country. And supporting the parents in their parenting role, both the adults and the child parents, helping them and supporting them and encouraging them and working with them so that hopefully they can become better parents, not only while they're in prison, but afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And our last speaker in this session is um, Continuing on the theme of children and parents in prison, Lena, the floor is yours. I want to start by saying thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Lena, and I work uh, in the Swedish NGO BUF. At BUF, we support children and youth with parents and family members in the penitentiary system. I've been working in this organization since May this year and I started right after I finished my studies to be a social worker. In my work, I meet families that are in need of information and support. My job is to listen to the individual family needs and then offer uh, them my support in the best way I can. Today I'm going to share with you a little bit of my story, uh, 
how it affected me during my adolescence and adult life to grow up with a mother in prison. I lived with my mother until I turned five. Uh, during these years, my mother got diagnosed with personality disorder and started to self-medicate by using drugs. She quickly developed an addiction, which eventually resulted in her losing the apartment we lived in. Her addiction and life decisions were not the optimal for a child, so I moved home with my father. During the time I lived with my father, he was struggling with an alcohol abuse and had a hard time keeping a job, paying the bills, and making sure that I had food to eat. By the time I turned seven, my, uh, the social security decided to place me in the home of my grandparents, where I lived until I got independent. I had spent a lot of time with my grandparents when I was a little girl. They often had me on holidays and weekends, so I felt very secure with them. The only problem my grandparents had when I moved in with them but was that a long time had passed since they took care of a child, so I had a hard time and struggled with satisfy, satisfying my needs, but they did the best they could uh, regard to the situation and the resources. My grandparents had separate be separated bedrooms and I shared room with my grandmother. We slept in the same bed and I didn't have any toys to play with. The clothes I had was inherited from my boy cousin that was four years older than me. And I remember I was happy for being with my grandparents, but I missed having a normal family and often felt jealous of my friends who lived with both their parents. During my childhood, my mother was imprisoned many times. For me, it was a relief every time she was incarcerated because that were the only times I knew she was safe and taken care of. My mother always wrote me letters and paintings when she was incarcerated, and I was always welcome to visit her. I have such great memories of the times I visit her. She always looked nice. In the prison, they had this solarium, and she was always tanned, and she would always bring me buns uh, to the visit that she made by herself. Always when I visit her, uh, it was in the same room that felt safe for me. The room was not child adapted, but I didn't care. The only thing that mattered for me was the fact that I got to spend time with my mother. My grandmother, who always accompanied me to the prison, would always step aside so that my mother and I could have some quality time together. Today, I am unbelievably grateful for all the times my grandmother followed me to prison and made it possible for me to spend that time with my mother. If I hadn't got the chance, I probably wouldn't have any kind of relationship with my mother today. I remember uh, that sometimes I hated my mother for not being there. I hated her because she put me into this world and later abandoned me. Sometimes I cried because I felt extremely lonely. I used to wonder if I was the only person in this world who had it like this. Even though I loved her from the bottom of my heart and more than anything in this world, and my only wish was that she would love me back in the same way that I loved her. As a child, I didn't get the help that I needed. I had nobody to talk to or share my feelings with. Uh, I had a constant feeling that, it was the only, that I was the only one in the world having a mother in prison. Nobody asked me about my family situation outside my grandparents' home, and I didn't tell anybody about my mother's situation. Because I didn't get any information or support, I, I assumed it was my burden and secret to carry. When I was growing up, I had a hard time making new friends, and, few, and the few friends I had did not know the truth about my mother. If somebody asked me about her, I always lied. I usually told them that she was abroad, or living in another city, or even sometimes I even told them she was dead. Unconsciously, as I was growing up, I developed certain survival strategies and coping mechanisms. As I grew older, these strategies became such a big part of me that I thought that this was who I am. It wasn't until I was 27 I got helped and realized that when I was a child, I had to develop these strategies because I needed them in order to survive. They were not me, just strategies, and I think I would have been 
that I would have been very different if I got the help that I needed. Anyhow, some of these strategies that I'm struggling with today are checking needs. I grew up with a feeling of not knowing how the next day would turn out. I didn't have any routines, so as an adult, I have the urge to have everything under control so that I never have to experience the feeling of uncertainty again. Emotionless. Because of the fear of being hurt, I build up a wall in order to protect myself. I would always make people believe they knew me, but if they would get too close, or if I started to like somebody, I would consciously push them away. I was afraid of being hurt, and it always felt easier to leave rather to be left. I became a chameleon. I learned to adapt my behavior and personality to different situations. Performance, anxiety, and confirmation need. I early learned that if I couldn't be loved for who I was, at least I could make people like me for the things I did. That made me confuse action with character. I was seeking confirmation in action and felt the need to always perform better than anybody else. And somewhere along the way, I lost track on the things that were important to me. I was always listening to everybody else's needs and desires. Today, I am a mother to a beautiful girl, and I could never in my wildest dreams believe in a greater love. But being a parent isn't anything that was obvious for me. I struggled with emotions and thoughts about the social heritage, thinking about the possibility of not being able to love or take care of my child. I live with the constant fear of failing in my parenthood the same way my parents did with me. I have such a great support from my partner, and I'm looking forward to what the future holds in a way that I couldn't dream about when I was growing up. The last time my mother went to prison was in 2007, and today she's been clean for nine years. It took me a long time to let her back into my life, and today I see her more like a best friend rather than as my mother. Today I know she will be there regardless of what I would ask of her. Um, and she's the most amazing grandmother to my daughter, a grandmother compensating for the times she couldn't be there for me. I have forgiven but I will never forget, because by never forgetting where I've been and what I went through, I will never lose hope in that everything is possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lena. That was at the end of the day, really positive uh, story you told us. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to take the floor, but we have uh, half an hour, I think, before the coffee break. So uh, who would like to, I see a hand raised down the end. I can't see who it is, but um, please take the floor and uh, Give your name and your organization. Thank you. My name is Panagiotis Panagiotopoulos. I'm a prosecutor of uh, a prosecution office of Thessaloniki, Greece. I would like to accomplish some things uh, about uh, children in uh, prison uh, who, whose fathers uh, and the mothers are in prison. Children whose parents are in prison have the risk twice than children whose parents are free to have an antisocial behavior, including law violation. Moreover, children whose parents are in prison often become victims of bullying at school and have the risk to be excluded from uh, the society, stigma that uh, Mrs. Uh, Brett mentioned. And finally, it has been ascertained that children who visit often their parents who are in prison have better emotional adjustment, higher IQ, and bigger improvement than children who don't visit uh, their parents in prison. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good to have that perspective from the prosecutor's office. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Novak, you asked for the floor. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think these were extremely strong statements. Um, <clears throat> and they brought back a lot of memories of my time as Special Rapporteur on Torture. Um, I've seen so many different places, both prisons uh, uh, for children, uh, but places where prisons, or where children were living with their parents in prisons, uh, institutions, and I simply can confirm whatever you said, for instance, about shaving. Uh, I've seen places in, in Central and Eastern Europe in particular, and uh, Central Asia, uh, where you had uh, whole institutions, uh, where the youngest was three, an orphan of three, and the oldest was a 16-year-old uh, boy who had committed some kind of, of, of misdemeanor, and the others were street children. But all were treated in the same way, being shaved, uh, being dressed in, in kind of prison uniform and locked up uh, and beaten up every day. Um, and, um, but I, <clears throat> I think also what you said, Rachel, uh, I mean, there are so easy ways of alternatives. If, to give you a positive example, in Denmark, for instance, um, that um, they created the possibilities for children visiting their parents in prison in a very, very child-friendly atmosphere. So the kids, small kids, didn't even have the feeling that they went to a prison. They had a different entrance. And it was like a, a children playground where they are going and they could meet their father there in normal clothes and didn't realize they were playing together and could leave again. It's very cheap, very easy. And then you see other prisons where children visit their parents and they can't even touch them because there's a, a screen there, there's a, a wall in between. And uh, many parents then told me uh, it's for them so painful. They don't want anymore to be visited by their children because they feel so ashamed. And, uh, and it's, it's for them emotionally much more difficult afterwards, after the kids left again. Um, so it's so easy to have alternatives. And of course, also what Rachel said, I mean, the main alternative is to think about uh, before you sentence a parent uh, to a prison sentence, what are alternatives, uh, at least for a period of time until the child grows up and can deal with it in a, in a better manner. Um, also, yeah, many thanks uh, for supporting the global study. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's again to bring all that together in a, in a concerted effort of really getting the data that we need in order then to develop joint recommendations, I think would make it much easier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manfred. Uh, Zsolt from the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. Thank you very much. So I'm Zsolt Sekeres from the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. And I would just like to reiterate one thought which um, was expressed during uh, this very valuable discussion, and that was that you know that something is wrong with your democracy when you start locking children up. And may I just add to that, that you know that something is something even worse if there is something worse than that is going on in your, in your democracy when you lock children up and you look out um, the access of civil society from those places where children especially, but people in general, not just children, are logged up. And if you take these two criteria and, and through these glasses, you look at uh, recent developments, um, you will see that something is clearly very wrong with, well, Hungarian democracy, for example, which is, of course, that I can talk about most, most in detail. What we have experienced in the past months in the Hungarian Helsinki Committee was that a new asylum regime was put up in Hungary in March when the systematic mass-scale detention of asylum-seeking children solely based on the fact that they are seeking asylum is now a norm and children as young as six months were locked up in the transit zones in the middle of nowhere in metal containers without air conditioning when it was 40 degrees outside with no shade, access to play or adequate care services for them. And the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, which has been monitoring places of detention for decades, has been systematically denied access to these places, uh, which is also a new development, not only to the transit zones, which were put up in the border with Serbia, but also to 
inland places of detention. The Helsinki Committee has been having a very fruitful cooperation with, uh, with, the, with the government agencies responsible for carrying out detention, and these cooperation agreements were all cancelled in the past months in a clear attempt to block our access to these places and to block our potential to raise concerns when concerns should be raised. And I think we cannot reiterate enough the importance of access of civilians to places like Topaz that Shara mentioned, which was a huge public outrage, as it rightly was. And, um, and I just wanted to raise his thoughts because they are, of course, incredibly important points to raise if you really believe that, uh, that these indicators say a lot about the state of your democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Schultz. And of course, um, I understand that Tofaz is still open, right? So there are still people in there. Uh, who would like the floor? Um, I don't see who owns the arm, but um, <laughs> the floor is yours. Increase mother in detention have their children in jail. Uh, if the, uh, the uh, children in, uh, in a special place, if they are under three years old, they go out of the prison and they, have, uh, they go out of prison only for school. And in prisons, we have uh, special play rooms with toys for the kids and uh, under uh, three years old. And uh, there are, uh, in two prisons, we have uh, special apartments with the mothers and fathers and their children uh, to live together. And they eat, they, they have uh, time together. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. It's good, um, as Manfred said, and uh, you are giving examples of what can be done, that we can do things differently. And I think that's what we need to focus on. Who would like to take the floor? Uh, Benoit? Thank you. Benoît van Kerswilk, uh, DCI, Defense for Children International. Um, I would like to follow up uh, after um, uh, our colleague's uh, statement concerning uh, the monitoring of uh, the places where children are deprived of liberty. Just to mention for those uh, who do not know that uh, we have uh, published a practical guide on monitoring detention places of where children are deprived of liberty in all kinds of settings, all kinds of places. Uh, this guide are available here in the, uh, in the other room. Um, and available on, on, online. Um, just to, to mention that, uh, as it has been said, it's so important to have uh, an external view and a professional view on what's going on in those places. We know, uh, it, we are talking about closed places. Most of the people do not know what happened, uh, n nor professional, and even the, uh, certainly not the broad public. And it's also very important to raise awareness of the public about what's going on in our countries because uh, most of the people just don't realize, and if they would realize, they would see all those images that we have seen today and uh, that uh, could be taken in so many countries, uh, they probably uh, wouldn't accept it uh, from their uh, society. But uh, besides monitoring, monitoring helps to control, to make sure that um, the, the worst things uh, don't happen. Uh, I think that we should also uh, use other means um, and, uh, for instance, using uh, strategic litigation to really fight against the worst um, attitude, the worst uh, experience that we have seen. 
uh, using um, legal mechanism against those decisions to the European Court on Human Rights, European Com uh, Social Committee applying the social, uh, European Social Charter, uh, go to the Committee on the Rights of the Child using uh, OP3, the uh, pro uh, third op uh, optional protocol, making sure that your country ratifies the OPCAT, the optional protocol for the Convention on, uh, Against Torture. All those mechanisms should be used much more. When I see that there are just a few decisions from those uh, uh, bodies and mechanisms, um, I think that we just miss opportunities. This should be part of uh, the advocacy of the NGOs and, I mean, even broader, uh, to provoke change. Uh, it won't happen only by visiting or only by denouncing the, those places. We really have to uh, act on a m much more proactive uh, way. So that was my uh, say. Thank you. Many thanks, Benoit. Um, people from Thank you. Um, I was solicited by the fact that uh, we are considering different kind of detention, different kind of phenomena, and I would like to share with you a couple of notes uh, uh, related with the fact that uh, um, I think that there should be a shift of paradigm in some way if we want to limit the vulnerabilities of children. In fact, we are continuing in some way to treat vulnerability have, as if it was a sickness. But uh, um, in fact, we have to start considering that vulnerabilities are determined by the context. Because other way, we are going to put the burden of uh, vulnerabilities to children in some way. So I think that uh, especially because we are talking about uh, the privation of liberty, um, we have to start to consider that the privation of liberty is probably the last kind of uh, uh, vulnerability that we impose to children. Uh, so I think that this is maybe an obvious thing, but it's not very much. Uh, we, are, we are continuing talking about exception, no? But the construction of vulnerability is a structural phenomenon that uh, we have to start to consider if we want to talk about the tension. And uh, uh, although, you know, uh, we have uh, the tension of children uh, is this kind of phenomenon where the quantity is not proportional to the relevance. No, the tension of children is uh, an indicator of uh, uh, malfunction in society. In some way, um, I feel, you know, the need to share that um, if we want to be closer to these children, we have to start considering that we are the one who are determining this vulnerability at various levels. And migration management is one of the examples. We tend to isolate and be very violent with the, the diversities with, uh, and with children. The fact that there are uh, children who are detained across Europe more and more, I mean, in some way, is uh, just an indicator that maybe the tension and isolation is a structural element of our development model. So unless uh, we are starting using like the CRC principles and provision as a kind of uh, ecological, ecological and um, um, uh, element for our new narrative, we will continue to be very much shocked by the image that were shown also this morning, and it's right to be shocked, but without connecting with them. So, um, yeah, I think that, yeah, just one more note that fragmentation is also, you know, there is a high degree of fragmentation in our analysis, in our action, and fragmentation is the exact place where the exception come in, and exception is the rule, unfortunately. So more and more children are violated by our system. And if we are not relating the detention or the vulnerability created in detention with the causes and the responsibility who are determining, even before the detention, this vulnerability, um, I think uh, we, we will continue using the same narrative that will make children even more vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, people. Indeed, deprivation of liberty says more about us 
adults than it does about children. But I'd like to pass the floor to Professor Ursa Kilkelly, who again is the, the Scottish volunteer <laughs> to um, draw some <laughs> draw some good Scottish volunteer. Uh, to draw some conclusions from what we heard in this session before the coffee break. And thank you very, very much to all our wonderful panellists. Thank you. So it's, it's impossible to try to sum up what we've heard this morning, but I uh, just want to make two or three um, points that I hope bring some of what the, the presentations and, and the um, presentations this morning together. Um, the first is the power and the importance of, of testimony, both in terms of personal story and uh, the documented evidence of what we see, uh, whether in our role as, as NGOs or, uh, or otherwise. Um, and clearly uh, what we saw in, in the images that we were presented with this morning is the, the undeniable truth about the appalling conditions in detention in the EU in 2017. Um, and also, I think, very uh, eloquently expressed as, as this preeminence of institutional need or concern over the needs and rights of children. Um, I think then there were two other aspects to this in follow-up um, for me. One is that um, really big steps need to be taken, um, that the big um, opportunities need to be taken to address the need for reform and change. Um, we saw examples, um, particularly George talked about the, the influence of the EU within the EU, and clearly the influence of the EU globally is also hugely important, and it's, no, um, uh, it's, a, it's a hugely significant issue in the context of the migration uh, and uh, humanitarian crisis that we're now uh, facing. Um, and our failure as, as a uh, union to address this with humanity and respect for the rights of, of individual children and their families. So we need to be conscious that we have an extraordinary power uh, both within the EU and in how the EU operates in the global world to affect change. And I think reflective of that throughout the presentations also is the, the power of advocacy the power of creating visibility and voice and giving and echoing um, those stories that we've heard this morning throughout the rest of the forum in, in terms of delivering accountability through the use of, of advocacy. Uh, and, and Benoit touched in particular on the use of all of the available remedies, uh, international and domestic, which need to be part of that whole strategy. But I think the other thing that was striking about this morning, and again, it cut across uh, most of the presentations, but was most powerfully and eloquently expressed by Lena is how the small things also matter. So uh, how we take time, how we prioritize time with children, how we prioritize um, making and sustaining, supporting their, the development of their relationships, creating happy memories. These are very small things that clearly can have a hugely powerful effect on the lives of individual children. So I think that um, needs to stay with us through through the forum as well. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Ursa. Um, coffee, half an hour break, and then we'll have the last session for the side event. So thank you all very much, and a big thank you to all the panellists.
Welcome back, everybody, to the final session of the side event. This session is the shortest one. It's only an hour with three speakers, but we should still have some time for discussion. Thank you to those who um, submitted from some feedback via the app. I'll tweet a photo of it now in a minute, but there's some very nice reminders of um, what has been said and key messages. Uh, at the end of the side event, if you could, if you would like to give feedback, please do so using the app and we'll extract it early tomorrow morning and make it available for the forum. So it would be good if you can do that. Um, before, before I forget and before we close, I would just like to thank all of the speakers who have been absolutely amazing and done a wonderful job. And all of you here in the room, there are many experts. You're all experts here in the room and you have a role to play. Uh, so please, in the forum, do your job. And um, thank you so much to my colleagues in the team. Tina, I didn't mention yesterday, but Tina, could you raise your hand? So Tina over there. Uh, Marta, as chief organizer, we would not be here without Marta. So once again, um, a big thank you to Marta. Tommaso and Kata. Uh, thank you very much. And to the SCIC conference organizers, Nella in particular, and our contractors who have done a great job, Tipic, and Maria. I haven't had a chance to see what you've done today, Maria, but thank you for all the graphic recording. Um, so first up now we have Rebecca O'Donnell, who is the co-founding director of Child Circle. And she is going to talk about Article 7 of Directive 2016-800 and its potential. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and just in an opening word, um, Child Circle is a non-profit centre of expertise on child protection measures in EU actions. And a key goal for us is to support actors to work together across professions and across borders to protect children. So we use European measures as a common starting point to build knowledge, guidance and practical tools that help practitioners and policymakers in their daily work. And we work with many organisations in this room to do that in the area of children in migration, children, child victims of violence and um, children disappearing. Um, and children in conflict with the law. Um, and we've heard much in this side event about the specific circumstances of children and how they may go either unidentified or unaddressed when a child is involved in criminal proceedings. Um, and we also have heard that if specific circumstances are identified and addressed, this is the capacity to transform the outcome of a criminal proceeding for a child. And as a simple example, properly engaging with some young offenders on literacy and training programs can help prevent them from reoffending. So we've been very interested in a recent provision of EU law which goes to this issue. As Margaret said, it's Directive 2016-800 on procedural safeguards for child suspects or child accused in criminal proceedings. And Article 7 of that directive contains a specific obligation to meet the needs of child suspects or accused. Now, member states have until the 11th of July 2019 to bring this directive into force. Ireland and the UK have opted out of the directive and Denmark is not subject to the directive, but the other member states should be implementing the provision. And I'd like to use the time now just to shine a spotlight on Article 7 and raise some issues for us to think about. And not just to think about, but to act upon together. <coughs> we are so many different actors in this room. We have social, health, 
legal professionals, policy makers, academics. So we really have an opportunity to work on this and we have, a, we have time to do it. Um, I'm going to ask to put up some of the text so we can just look at some key elements together. If I can work this, maybe this way, yes. So, why an individual assessment? Now, the directive provides that member states shall ensure that the specific needs of children concerning protection, education, training, and social integration are taken into account. And for that purpose, children who are suspects or accused in criminal proceedings shall be individually assessed. And the assessment shall in particular take into account the child's personality and maturity, economic, social, and family background, and any specific vulnerabilities that the child may have. So you can see just how specifically relevant this is to what we've been discussing. No, I'll go the other way. Um, the nature of the assessment may vary depending on certain circumstances, but children should not be going into detention without that assessment. So how is the assessment used? Um, and you can see from these three points that it's used very, very broadly across the whole proceeding. Whether that's about determining whether there are special measures needed during the proceeding or the appropriateness of a precautionary measure, and that might include pretrial detention, or taking any decision in the criminal proceedings, including sentencing. And so law enforcement and justice professionals should have more information before they take these decisions. How is the decision, how is the assessment carried out? So they should be carried out uh, at the earliest possible moment by qualified personnel um, with the close involvement of the child and following as far as possible a multidisciplinary approach. Um, I won't go through all of the directive, I just thought it was important for you to see those elements. So thank you. Um, so there are some very interesting and important issues here. When we see close involvement of the child, I think of Sarah Lundy's presentation yesterday and Stephanie Rapp this morning. And clearly we need to think about how and for what purposes a child is closely involved. Um, what purposes for them? beyond simply eliciting information from them, but what's the power of the process itself to engage with the child? Um, qualified personnel, that brings into play the special skills that may be essential to really decipher what is happening in the child's situation, including the mental health issues um, and issues that Hugh Williams talked about yesterday. And having a multidisciplinary approach brings us back to the recent guidance of the Committee on the Rights of the Child in the area, with its insistence on taking a holistic approach to the child's situation. And it also takes us back to the Commission's proposal for 10 principles for integrated child protection systems, which were put forward at, the, um, at this forum two years ago. Um, and those principles say that the necessary protocols and processes should be in place between professionals and practitioners working with children to facilitate their roles and responses to violence. Um, so we can see, I think, that Article 7 has real potential to ensure that children's needs are addressed in all aspects of proceedings, including detention, but only if it's properly implemented. And there clearly are a lot of questions to think about how it might best be implemented. But let's remember that having a common EU law provision means that we can more easily share knowledge and good practice across member states. And having a common EU provision means we can develop together common practices. And that's the opportunity I think we should be focusing on here with that almost two year window of uh, transposition. What was the state of play before the directive was adopted? What had the commission seen? Uh, the commission typically um, commissions an impact assessment study and in this case they looked at what vulnerability assessment mechanisms existed um, in different member states. Now, it showed at the time that generally there were just simply case-by-case -case approaches to assessing um, vulnerability. 
uh, in the case of children, with only one systematic approach to vulnerability assessment in a member state. <coughs> Excuse me. In some cases, these assessments only involved questioning in police stations. In other cases, other professionals were involved. So although there have been recent developments since 2012, we also know, thank you, that from more recent research, that there is some ground still to cover. <coughs> Excuse me. So what can we do? Now, one EU-funded project has recently touched upon this, and it's, the Belgian, it's, it's led by the Belgian section of the Defence for Children International, and it's called My Lawyers, My Rights, and it involves a number of organisations here in, in the room. And the project explores many of the aspects and problems concerning the roles and skills of lawyers when involved in uh, representing children in criminal proceedings. But of course, amongst other things, the, 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 the project is seeking to raise awareness of the uh, role of the lawyer in relation to the individual assessment. And given that Article 7 has, such, has potential to be so central to the outcomes, the lawyer clearly needs to be involved. Uh, involved in some way, or at minimum fully informed of what the individual assessment says. So that project uh, will develop training and advocacy manuals to trigger reflection by lawyers and policymakers on what needs to happen. And that's a step forward, and the manuals be will be published in 2018. But of course, beyond lawyers, there are a range of professionals who need to explore together how you do this. Um, and I think Article 7 really raises some interesting questions on whether and how cooperation takes place between the state actors which are focusing on the needs of children on the one hand and the state actors who are focusing on enforcing the law on the other hand. So how do law enforcement and child protection actors work together and with children and with children's families when a criminal law proceeding is underway? I've seen recently some of the multi-agency work in the UK in the case management tools that are used there for that purpose. Um, and obviously really properly implementing a provision which has an individual assessment that is meant to lead to outcomes for children. And really implementing that might need some significant change in procedures. It may require protocols between family law courts and criminal law courts to link up the situation of a child in conflict with the law and their family law situation. It may involve changes to how services are provided. Um, for example, is the criminal law able to focus on solutions rather than just punishments? Um, and there's a very interesting article which I'd encourage you all to read and which I was grateful to Margaret for circulating, which was by the um, family law uh, court judge in England, James Mumby, and perhaps it's in the materials, but if it's not, uh, it, it might be circulated. It's a very interesting exploration, not only of what needs to happen, but really how it can happen and what are the really uh, difficult uh, issues. One of the striking things in it was he said, um, that in maybe, uh, I won't put a date on it, but many years ago there was a realisation that they needed a particular kind of family law court. And it took just 40 years <laughs> for that to be established. And we're probably at the stage here where we realise that certain practices for children need to be put in place and we may need some specialised proceedings. I hope it won't take 40 years for these things to happen. But I think we all have an ability uh, to work together and make it happen um, sooner. Now, apart from thinking of what should happen in this area, we can look into what's already happening in other fields to get inspiration. And one of the things I think about in that regard is another EU-funded project, which is the Promise Project, led by the Council of Baltic Sea States, in which we're involved, and Turid Heiberg is here uh, from the Council of Baltic Sea States, so if people want to know more about the Promise Project, there are people in the room um, to talk about that. That looked at practice um, concerning child victims of violence, um, and it looked at the practice that started in Iceland and is spreading across Scandinavia and beyond, where you have uh, agencies working together under one roof to address children's needs. 
So it really avoids secondary victimization for children and having to go through repeat interviews in different locations, having to go to different places for a medical examination. Um, but here under one roof, these things can happen. The judges will come and listen and interrogate and interview the child there. Um, and it also enables specialization and better uh, cooperation um, between agencies. But we saw in the Promise Project that it involved a real need to develop standards, a vision. We saw you might need quite sophisticated data protection agreements between agencies. So we looked to gather together all of that in standards um, and other um, uh, documents. It's on a website, please go and look at it, and we have a new project continuing from that. So, to conclude, um, some effort and rigour will be needed to implement Article 7 in an effective way. And member states may need to develop new procedures or adapt and improve existing procedures. But let's, let's agree here that an individual assessment should not simply be regarded as a tick-the-box exercise. I have asked the child some questions about their circumstances. I've thought about it, and that's that. It would represent real progress across Europe if we can use that provision of our common legal framework as a real engine to help children out of crime and into better lives. So I, again, I'm really grateful for having had the opportunity to shine a spotlight on it, and I really hope to hear from people here and to talk with people beyond this forum on how we can do this. Thank you. Many thanks, Rebecca. That was very valuable. And it's great that we're able to have this discussion a year and a half before the entry into force of the directive. So plenty of time to prepare a property. Um, or not, but no, plenty of time. It's good. Um, the promise material that Rebecca mentioned, in the background document, you have a link to EU-funded projects. And in there, I put a link to all the Promise resources. So it's in there if you want to find them. Um, next, we move to Ireland, which uh, hasn't signed up, unfortunately, to Directive 2016-800. But we have two very interesting and wholly complementary presentations from Pat Bergen, first of all, who is the director of Oberstown um, children Detention Campus. Pat, the floor is yours. Sorry, thank you very much for having me here today. I think it's still morning, is it? Or is it afternoon? It's still morning. Um, just to, to kickstart, um, if you hear me uh, whisk, whisk, it's because I'm getting kicks under the table to finish within 15 minutes, so I'll do my best to, to cover what I need to, to cover. Um, just to begin, um, in relation to Oberstown, Oberstown is uh, the only facility of its kind in Ireland where young people um, are placed there to the courts, either on remand or on committal orders in respect of um, criminal behaviour. Um, it has a long history. Um, over the past number of years, there were three different schools there. Um, and in recent years, they have come together under one uh, new facility. Uh, called Oberstown Children's Detention Campus. So I'm hoping to give you an overview of that facility and some of the challenges uh, that we have experienced, but also the initiatives that we've attempted to um, build in to the campus to try and address some of the issues of young people coming into detention um, and trying to break the cycle of young people coming into detention. Um, I've been in this role for four years, um, and when I started, somebody asked me um, how was I going to de deem uh, to have had a successful role in Oberstown, and there was a lot of thinking on it, and somebody came back to me and said, well, actually, when you run a campus, that's half full, and I didn't understand that for a while. What it meant was when you can contribute to ensuring that children aren't placed in Oberstown, then you'll have identified... Uh, a process of working with children in communities and other services, and that's what we've attempted to do. So how can we work with other services to maintain children outside of Overstown? So just to kickstart, um, I'm not sure how clear this is, but that's Overstown. 
Okay, just to give you a sense um, of what it is. People wonder where it is. It's near Dublin Airport, for any of you that come in and out of the country. It's not far from Dublin Airport. 55 million went into that campus in the past three or four years. Um, it can accommodate up to 82 young people. Um, currently, there's 265 staff working there. Um, but in reality, what we have is about 40 young people on campus at any one stage. This morning, there's 32. Um, 14 of those are on remand. The rest are on committal orders. And in the middle of that, there's one girl. Um, she's with us for a week, and then she will be um, back to court, and we don't know what will happen there. The facility um, that's there, um, I suppose, has come together on the basis of those three different schools, long history, and I suppose some of the points that were made this morning highlight, um, I suppose, in for Ireland, some of the challenges around culture, uh, where children have been maintained, um, and the focus for me has been about bringing the outside world in. Um, I speak about that, that yellow line around the outside of that um, is the fence. Um, and I speak about uh, taking the fence down and let people in. We still have to have the fence because if they run away, I'm in trouble. Um, but it's about welcoming in different services, different um, organizations. Um, and the key focus for us, and, and I've put this out quite strongly, is that we don't have all the skills that are necessary to address young people's behavior within the campus. We don't have all the skills to maintain young people out of Oberstown, and we need help in doing so. Um, and that has been a substantial challenge. The risk in inviting people in is we then will get criticised. Um, and that's been a challenge because in inviting people in, they will see areas that, um, where improvement is required. And that's not a bad thing, but that is for me to deliver. And that in itself um, can raise issues for staff, for management, for young people, for families. Uh, for people living in the area, because the question is then is what's wrong in there? It should be working properly, you know, you should know what you're doing. But unfortunately, human beings, including children, are complicated. Um, and part of the issue we have to look at is how do we continue to improve what we do and how we do it? Um, and that's what I found interesting here today um, it, and, and yesterday in relation to some of the, the, the presentations. You know, absolutely, they're a key issue for us. Um, children who have uh, problems with mental health, and you hear the research here, goes, well, actually, we have this at first hand. Problems with education, we have those issues. So we've invited a lot of people in, and later on, Anne is going to uh, talk to us about uh, one of the initiatives we have in relation to working with parents in the community um, to try and mentor the parents to support those children when they leave so they don't come back. But there's a few bits and pieces I'd like to share with you, um, in particular around uh, the children in Overstown, if that's okay. Um, earlier on this year, we undertook a, a file review um, in relation to the number of young people that were on campus for the first quarter of 2017. So I think some of this is important, and it is uh, the information is uh, next door as well, if people are interested, or it's on our website. But if I could go through some of the specifics, um, for the first three months in 2017, we had 69 children that came across our door. Um, of that 69, um, 33 of them were on detention orders and 36 were on remand. What does being on remand mean for a young person? It means they're in court today. The judge has said, go out to Oberstown, come back next week, and the adults and the services around will decide what to do with you. So that young person has no interest in being involved with us from a, a relationship perspective. We're holding them. So the challenging behaviours that they will display are real because their view is on gone next week. Um, and we have to manage that, their behaviour, we have to support them, and we also have to, I suppose, ensure their rights are met, their families are engaged with, um, and that's a real challenge. I heard this morning about uh, children and their parents and the importance of that connectivity. Absolutely. Somebody tell me how I deal with parents who bring drugs into their children. I put up a screen, yet I'm told, you know, you're not allowing parents to have contact with their children. I search children. I search adults to try and allow a situation where they have that connectivity. Last week, we had the first case of a parent being prosecuted in relation to bringing drugs into the campus. 
So they're the real issues. You're trying to look at maintaining rights for children, rights for adults, rights for parents, but there are real challenges in doing this. Um, how do you ensure then that that young person who is a father um, has contact with their newborn baby when there's an issue about whether actually they are um, vulnerable themselves in relation to the capacity to care for that child or the child is vulnerable. So there's, there's real challenges. Um, so I think it's, it's important to consider those. I keep going with the figures if this helps. Um, I suppose in relation to the uh, 69 that were placed with us in, in 2017, 10 of those it was the first time. So the age profile, to give you a sense, you're talking about 14 to 18 year olds as the majority of them are boys. Um, and the fact that 10 new young people, the capacity is that they will be back around again. They will be out on remand, they come back into us. And that, for them, is quite difficult. Um, in relation to um, key factors, I'm going to put on my glasses if you don't mind, in relation to young people's mental health, 38 were deemed to have mental health. So of 69, 38 were deemed to have mental health problems um, prior, prior to admission. So we looked at files and we went, this has been already identified out of community. At the top end of the scale, um, we found that 45% of those young people that were with us had been in state care prior to coming into us. So they were already known to the care service, they already had been in and out, and many of them had been in multiple placements prior to coming into us. So they became involved in the juvenile justice system on the basis of challenges they experienced either in the care setting or that the care setting wasn't robust enough to, to care for them. Other issues that came up in relation to education, the majority of young people coming into us had not been attending education prior to their admission. 49% of them had not been attending. So you look at the, the structures, they come into us and you go to school. Actually, they love going to school. There's a structure there, there's an engagement. Um, the teachers are focused around their individualities, but they couldn't cope with the 30 or 40 children in class. They've fallen out, mommy didn't get them up in the morning or daddy didn't get them up, education wasn't the priority. Now they're in a routine. But that's a, that's a real, real challenge for them. In relation to that, that group, 54% or sorry, 54 um, of the young people had dabbled in substance misuse. 54 of 69 before they came into us. So when they come across the door, the issues, that's what they're, that's where they're at. That's the experiences they have. So they're coming into Mr. Bergen and he said, well, you can't have drugs. Well, mammy will get them into me or I'll get them in some way. Um, I'm not going to school. Um, I don't want to be here. So as a consequence, that the behaviour that they displayed on some occasions is very, very difficult. Let me tell you about last week. I was dragged into a court in relation to a young man who was looking for bail. Uh, we progressed it and the High Court granted him bail. And I went out to process the bail. And he says, I don't want bail. I want to stay here. I want to finish off my time here. And I go, OK, hang on. How am I going to manage this? Rang his father. No, he needs to stay there. So because the young person didn't sign the documents, because his father didn't want him out, he continues to be there because he feels safer in there than out. And also because he's afraid if he goes out, he's got to be back with his peer group and back into Obersound. So I'm happier to be here. He only has a couple of weeks, but that's his, that's his choice. So these are the real challenges for some of these young people in relation to um, their experiences. So what have we done? So we have looked at a whole range of different initiatives. So one of those, um, there is YAP, the Youth Advocacy Programme. They've been with us for about two years, and they've been mentoring young people on the campus prior to them leaving. And the idea is that they can affect some change, look at the environment they're going back to, whether it's education, whether it is training, whether it is accommodation. And when young people leave us, that there is that level of an adult that is aware of their experience in Oberstown and continuing then that, that experience outside and try and support them. Um, there's been 25 young people over the past two years that have engaged in that project. Um, but there are limitations to it. And the limitations to it are that young people themselves, if they're going back into the environment that they've come from, they themselves might be willing to progress or change, but the environment themselves at home have not. And in a few moments, Anne will talk about the work that Lekele are doing with mentoring parents. We've had other initiatives in relation to understanding where staff are at around the relationship model with young people. What are we trying to do? 
I speak often in relation to the fact that if you send me a 15-year-old and he has a sentence for 15 months, how much change do you expect me to achieve with a 15-year-old who has had 15 years of chaos, 15 years of unstructured routines, and you expect me in 15 months to change that young person? I'm not going to. And these are the real, real challenges within a detention facility around what are the, what are the outcomes we hope to achieve. I'm watching the time. I'll tell, if you don't mind, I, I, I'll tell a story that is well known to, to Oberstam. I have three minutes. Uh, last August, 12 months, we had a significant incident on the campus, and there was a number of young boys involved in that. Um, and we've had a long uh, year with them. Um, and I suppose part of the, the lesson for all the staff on campus is that three or four of those young people are now being advocated by the staff on the campus to have time out. Can we extend our placement on, on the campus because they've hit 18 years of age? We didn't give up on those lads. We didn't give up even though they seriously challenged us 12 months ago. Yet now I'm looking at a, a, a group of staff who see the benefit, who see, saw the uh, capacity of those young people. Um, and as a consequence then, you have people canvassing me saying, look, he's 18, we don't want him to send him to prison, he's another six or 12 or eight months or whatever it is left in his sentence, can he stay with us? The answer being yes. But part of that is that, I suppose from an Oberson perspective, there are challenges in managing young people in detention. They don't want to be there, they have complex needs. We are expected to do it right, and we don't always do it right, and there will be shortcomings. Um, we will get, um, I suppose, ridiculed for those shortcomings, and that's probably correct, but there has to be an understanding that you can't fix overnight issues or challenges that have gone on for a long, long period of time. And there are cultural changes, there are uh, requirements for uh, different approaches, and that's what we're trying to do. I've gone way off my presentation, but I hope that gives you some insight in relation to, I suppose, what it's like in a detention facility for young people. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. That was um, very inspiring, and I think your frankness and transparency and honesty um, just inspire a huge amount of confidence. It, it was really valuable. Uh, now I'd like to pass the floor to Anne Conroy from Lekele, uh, who will speak about their work with um, young people and their families. And the floor is yours. the case may be is the, the mic are you hearing me okay okay so first of all thank you to Ursula and to Margaret for the invitation to present today with Pat um, my presentation is focused on the importance of targeted uh, supports for young people and their families in order to one reduce the number of young people who are going into detention because we shouldn't lose sight of that and secondly to support young people in detention and reduce the rate of recidivism So just to tell you a little bit about the youth justice context in Ireland. In 2001, we had the Children Act, and that focused on enshrining into law diversion and alternatives to young people going into detention. And part of that law was providing for mentoring for young people on probation. And in 2005, Lakela was set up. So Lakela is the organisation that I work with, and Lakela means, it's the Irish word for together. And we are an NGO, we're funded by the Department of Justice and the ESF, so it's very appropriate to be able to speak today. And we work in partnership with the Probation Service in Ireland. So a little bit more about Lakela. Um, our vision is that for every young person at risk, the right supports at the right time to make the most of their lives. So that's very much underlying our commitment to young people's rights to realise their full potential, which, contri which contributes to reducing youth crime and in turn contributes to reducing young people going into detention. 
mentoring for young people on probation, that's our, our core service. And just to, I suppose, tell you about the profile of young people we would deal with, which I suppose is quite similar to the profile of, that Pat mentioned earlier. Um, young people typically are not in school or education or training. They're, they've been involved in repeat offences, involved in substance abuse, poor supervision by parents, history of being in care, history of involvement with many services. Um, the mentoring happens in the community. So that means you've got, it's one-to-one, -one, a, a volunteer mentor meeting with a young person in the community. It could be going to have a cup of coffee, going to have a game of pool, going to the cinema, going to a football match, whatever they're interested in. Um, and we have over 200 volunteer mentors nationally. And just to say a little bit more about the volunteers, the, the volunteer status of the mentors is really appreciated by the young people and indeed by the parents. The fact that the volunteers are not part of the system is instrumental in getting and keeping the young people on board. Um, and of course, we have a whole system of recruiting, vetting, training, support, supervision, all of that with staff coordinating all of that and recording outcomes and monitoring and all of that is very important. So in 2016, we had an evaluation um, where we got an independent evaluator to, to look at the impact of the mentoring. And that was published in 2017. So it found that there was significant reduction in terms of the offending behaviour by the young people. Um, the report refers to a figure of 28% reduction, which it took as a very cautious figure uh, as regards reduction in offending behaviour, and also significant reduction in alcohol and drug use by the young people. On the, on the improvement side, the report found that there were significant improvements in terms of young people's self-confidence, communication skills, hopefulness, involvement in activity, education, outside the home activities, and improvements in relationships with family and persons in authority. And the evaluation concluded that Lakela mentoring was more effective than other research on mentoring in the kind of youth justice system. And it also highlighted that it's all about the relationship formed between the mentor and the young person. Um, and that's, people in the room will, that's not a surprise. It, at the end of the day, it is all about the relationship that, the, that the, the worker or the volunteer can form with the young person. So what happened then if the young person went into detention? Because that sometimes happened that we were, the young person was doing mentoring and suddenly they disappeared. Um, in, and the mentoring just stopped abruptly. And sometimes they've been getting on really well on probation and with their mentor, um, and maybe they, were, they got a conviction for something that happened in the past, and they got a, a, a custodial sentence. Um, so we started looking at that and saying, you know, could we continue with the mentoring relationship when they went into detention and also afterwards? And in 2015, we had discussion with Pat in Oberstown, um, and agreed that we would put in place arrangements so that if a young person is with Lakela and has a mentor, we will stick with them if they go into detention. So it's before, during and after. Um, and we'll stay with the young people. And, and th they, we get really positive feedback from the, the young people, parents and staff about that. I should say that we also do that for young people in adult prisons because there are young, young adults, young people in the Irish context who would be in adult prisons. And we, we continue to do that with those young people as well. Now to look at parent mentoring. So I want to share with you the results of the evaluation in terms of the impact of parent mentoring. Um, and when I say parents, we're talking about parents, carers, foster carers, grandparents, whoever will be the significant adult for the young person. And the evaluation found improvements in the parent's relationship with the child in trouble and other children, improvements in involvement in activities outside the home, education or work, improved communication skills, parenting skills, ability to manage stress and self-confidence and self-esteem. And the evaluator concluded that the improvements in emotional well-being and particularly hopefulness were most significant as prerequisites for the parent or carer being able to support their young person in trouble.
when parents were asked with the overall helpfulness of mentoring, most of them gave it a 9 out of 10. Um, you can see the kinds of comments there, some examples. I don't know how we'd have managed without them. It was a lifeline. It saved my life. Um, quite often we were dealing with parents or carers who were in very desperate situations. We get really positive feedback about parent mentoring. And I should say that participation by the parents is totally voluntary. They don't have to, they're referred or recommended for it, but they don't have to do it. We get a, we get a take up rate of over 90% who stick with it for a year to two year period. Um, and it's, comple it's completely up to themselves as to whether they stay with it or not, but it, it works really well. And last year, we started a discussion with Oberstown about making parent mentoring available to parents or carers of young people in Oberstown. And over time, we developed a proposal and managed to secure some funding. So um, in this year, in April of this year, uh, we employed a part-time coordinator for a two-year period. So he is based in Oberstown. And at, at this stage, we have 15 volunteer mentors, specially recruited and trained. We have started um, matching some parents with, with our mentors. There's a whole system of structures and outcomes in place as to kind of how, what will happen and how it's run. The, the first referrals have been made. Um, it's really innovative internationally. We haven't been able to find in the literature, in the research, another example of parent mentoring of parents of, of young people in detention. Um, I would say it's very challenging work, but also very, worth, very much worth persevering. So we're very excited about that. Lastly, my picture of a lovely giraffe. And that's a prompt to, to me and to us all, I suppose, to remind us of that all of us involved in services or policy for children in detention or in conflict with the law, that we need to stick our neck out for these children and young people. They're very vulnerable young people that we're talking about. In terms of youth offending, the numbers are relatively small. And it is about us, it is about children's rights to make the most of their lives. It's about us sticking our necks out to support that. And lastly, you have my contact details and the reference for the evaluation if you want to find any more, more about the mentoring. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, the volunteer mentors, I, I was asking who they are. They're people from the community. They could be you or me. They're not professionals. So it's not rocket science. Look at what a, a wonderful job they're doing. And maybe that deserves replication in other countries. So I'm sure Lakela wouldn't complain if others were to copy. So thank you. That was a very positive note to end on. Let's all stick our necks out. Um, any questions from the floor? I am Susanna Marietti from the Italian NGO Antigone. Uh, I just would like uh, quickly to share with you a personal concern, uh, personal meaning that it regards uh, especially Italy. Uh, while uh, with one hand, uh, Italy was uh, uh, giving, uh, through Caterina Chinnici, a strong uh, contribution for Directive 800 for coming to light, with the other, the Italian government uh, was presenting uh, a bill to the parliament uh, according to which uh, the uh, prosecutor officers and uh, judge courts uh, for minors would be accorpated to those for adults, uh, thus unavoidably weakening the possibility of having a specific attention to minors and uh, an individual assessment. The law has not been voted yet, and we really hope it will never. Thank you for that. Uh, one, then Kula, then uh, Marion, and Helmut. So all that is apparently just frozen. Where the brains are. 
Hello, um, my name is Barry Goldson. I'm from the University of Liverpool. I've been um, thinking about researching and uh, writing about child detention for uh, longer than I care to remember. And it's uh, an absolute privilege to have been invited and it's a great privilege to be sharing uh, the hall with so many uh, experts and, and uh, learned people. Um, it's an observation, if I may, and then followed by a question to the panel. The, the observation is that uh, reflecting on the last um, yesterday and today, the, the, and if you forgive the paradox, the, the, the message that really screams out at me is the question of, of silence. Um, and silence and silencing, it seems to me, operates on at least three levels. Uh, the first level is silencing children and young people who are detained within the institutions that concern us at this forum. And we heard very powerful statements yesterday by uh, Pinar and Ellen about just how that silencing leaves uh, young people uh, feeling. A second level, it seems to me, silencing operates at, a, at, at an institutional level. And the powerful uh, statement that was made, and I have to confess, I can't quite recall by whom, but it's been referred to on several occasions throughout the forum, is where the needs of institutions take precedence over the needs and indeed the rights of children, particularly uh, where institutions will obfuscate or will perpetuate silence if they are confronted with inconvenient voices or voices that inconvenience their imperatives and priorities. And then the third level, of course, is where silence operates at a, at a higher level, at a political level, and we've heard various contributions that have also articulated that, where the needs of power, the needs uh, of, of, of political interest take precedence over democratic principles, over questions of transparency, over public interests. Taken together, the individual, the institution, and the political manifestations of silence all serve, of course, to silence truth, to obfuscate knowledge, to deny evidence, and perhaps most importantly and most reprehensively, to profoundly compromise the human rights of a, um, of a profoundly uh, disadvantaged group of young people. So it goes all, and uh, my, my um, observation then is that we've got to do uh, all that we can both individually and collectively to challenge the culture of silence and the different practices of silencing. And in, in this respect, of course, the global study is absolutely imperative. And the fact that it appears to be lacking political support and financial resources is itself an insidious uh, reminder of the forms of silencing to which uh, I refer. So that's my observation, if I may, Chair. Uh, my question to the panel is, do they have, drawing from their own experiences, any particular comments or contributions or responses to make about the silencing at different levels? Thank you very much, Barry. So we have three more speakers in this speaking role. Kula, you're next, and then Marion, and then Helmut. I don't think I can follow, I'm going to follow that in a very different way. My name is Kuli Yasuma and I am the Commissioner for Children in Northern Ireland. Um, so another Irish voice uh, with an English accent and a Cypriot name. Um, I, I want to be quite practical and talk about um, what I saw as the same, uh, the common thread through all three um, very helpful presentations that we've just had, uh, which is about if we see the individual child through individual assessments, as you were describing um, there, Rebecca, um, then it makes sense that we follow that child and that assessment through whatever context that they, we may find them in. And if we do do an individual assessment, the chances are they're less like, and, and follow through on a service that will address those needs, they're less likely to end up in, in the sort of place Pat describes, because when you look at what the background is of those children, we, early intervention and prevention would, would have helped. 
And that brings me to something else that Rebecca said. Um, you, you said something that stuck with me is the, the dilemma between state actors focusing on need and those state actors focusing on law enforcement. And I think that's a false dichotomy. And I think particularly in roles like mine, it's my job to remind every state actor, or it's all our jobs actually, uh, to remind every state actor that where they have, where their work um, interacts with a child or a family, that it, there's no contest. That if we use children's rights as the framework, so we need to get to a place where there, there isn't a competition between accountability or law enforcement and the best interests of a child. That, that is a force, and that is what's often used, by, particularly by political actors, to, to silence children's rights voices. So I suppose, um, it, again, it's just, an, uh, it's just an observation that if we did proper assessment of children and families and parents particularly, then maybe we wouldn't need uh, places like, uh, or places to be as big as Oberstown or any, in, in, my play, in my place, in Woodlands in Northern Ireland or any other place, we should be able to look after our children in, in the community. Thank you, Gula. Marion McLeod. Uh, I'm Marianne McLeod from Children in Scotland, which is the national network for children's services uh, in Scotland. Um, yeah, I suppose what I am uh, uh, wanting to say follows on a bit from uh, what Kula has just said, uh, and that um, I've, uh, not for the first time, uh, because I've been working in policy planning and service delivery for children and young people at risk for getting on for 40 years now and and I, I find it quite um, depressing really that we seem to go around in the same circles over and over again and that we hear you know uh, uh, speaker after speaker say uh, that the young people who end up getting detained uh, and I would say I'm talking not about migrant children here because I think that's that's a, a different issue um, uh, but the young people who are uh, detained uh, by the state for various other reasons, have backgrounds of poor education, of mental health difficulties, many of them are care experienced, uh, and the circumstances that bring them into these establishments are poverty, are poor support for families, lack of nurturing and attachment, and indeed most of the solutions that are presented are about offering children a constructive and supportive relationship, often for the first time in their lives. So perhaps it's not surprising that they are deprived of the emotional needs that actually end up with circumstances that put them in detention. But what bewilders me after nearly 40 years is why do we keep repeating the patterns rather than looking at what are very clearly the things that we need to put in place to prevent these things happening to children and why are we not at national and supranational level not actually making very very clear and unambiguous statements about that that wasn't a question sorry <laughs> <laughs> thank you Marion um, indeed why um, we did include things in the background paper around that and indeed why why are we still here? Uh, Helmut Sachs, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, my, name, my name is Helmut Sachs. I'm from the Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights uh, in Austria. Um, first of all, thank you for the um, insights in your presentations. Actually, my comment was triggered by an observation by uh, Pat Bergin. Um, as you have mentioned, that actually many of your clients um, actually are well known to the institutions already before. Um, I'm wondering um, to what extent we should have a more closer look at what does child protection systems actually mean and its relationship to prevention of uh, deprivation of uh, liberty of, of children. Um, because that's, that's a common feature that many of them are known to the authorities before, child protection authorities, care authorities. Um, we, we have discussions also in Austria, in my, my country, how to improve the, the cooperation between, why do we have to, to, or sometimes it creates the impression we have to wait until they are 14, they fall under criminal responsibility because then there is an institution to take care of them, um, which is an indication for, for me that on the one hand, um, we actually do not really fully grasp how to work with the families to, to prevent uh, all that kind of situations. Um, secondly, there is often a thinking once they are in the institution, in the, in the justice sector, 
Um, then there is someone who looks after them. But what does happen in between uh, with the family? Um, you, you cannot just um, wait until the, the child is released, actually, if no one has worked with the family, no, no change in the, in the context, actually. Um, then, of course, you, you cannot expect that um, the child upon release will um, have better perspectives than before, of course. Um, so I think that's, that's one struggle. Um, and finally, um, because we had a situation last year, a case in, in court in, in Austria where a child, a 17-year-old girl from, from Serbia, um, was convicted for 134 cases of theft um, where there were clear indications that she was actually trafficked and forced to commit uh, these crimes. But unfortunately, there was not enough evidence uh, to go on the trafficking case. And so actually, it was easier to, to convict her for, for the theft. Uh, and even uh, the, the most um, embarrassing was actually that the lawyer pleaded that she would receive a prison sentence because he said that's the only possibility for her to get out of this situation of dependency she, she was in. Uh, and she was convicted for one and a half years. Um, although it was obvious that she actually was not guilty in, this, in the meaning of that she was actually compelled to commit all these crimes. And it, for, for me, it also shows actually fundamentally, something fundamentally went wrong with our child protection system. If, if we, on the one hand, uh, talk about last resort, and then we actually plead to have someone put into prison because we, we somehow did not feel other appropriate alternatives under our child protection system. So I think there is something fundamentally wrong here. Thank you. Thank you, Helmut. Uh, I'd just like to plug that in 2018, we will relaunch a call for proposals that we raised this year on preparations for leaving care, because that's one of the biggest gaps in alternative care. Uh, the absolute lack of support and preparation for leaving care. But why didn't we get the right proposals from the right people? So we launch it again, and we do hope that the people and the organisations who work directly with children in alternative care and who can make a difference will apply for funding this year, next year, 2018. Um, there's a, you would like the floor here at the front. Yes, hi. Uh, in line with individual assess assessment and support and how we can give support to these children. Oh, here. Yes, uh, Camila Orellana from a BUF NGO that, su that gives support to children that have incarcerated parents. Yes, in line with the individual assessment and the support we can give to these children, I would like to ask Lina a question. Uh, do you think that uh, anything would have been different if you had gone to an NGO like the one you work in today? Um, yes, I think so. I would love to uh, be given the opportunity to meet others in similar situations because uh, I felt I was the only one in the world having it like this. And uh, I would love to have uh, tools to handle the situation I was in. And I, th I think um, that if I would have gotten the tools, I wouldn't uh, ended up with um, these problems and I could have handled them when growing up instead of being an adult. Thank you very much, Lina, and thank you for that question. Who else would like to take the floor? Okay. Um, Don O'Leary. Hi, m my name is Don O'Leary. I'm the director of uh, the Cork Life Centre, an education project for young people out of formal education. And I think, you know, one of the, the, the contributors there said it was very sad that after 40 years we're still having the same discussions. And I think we need to change the type of discussion we're having because it's obvious from the figures we've just received from Pat Bergen and listening to other people that the issue in relation to our children ending up in the, the, the justice system is not because there are problems with them, but because there are problems with our system. Our system is creating um, 
or criminalising the most vulnerable children in our community. So children in, ca in care do not get the proper care. They're ending up in the juvenile justice system. Children in problems and issues with mental health who don't get the proper support are ending up in the juvenile justice system. And we continue to criminalise our young people. And until such time, and we have to keep restating these facts, because I think they're sometimes missed. We blame the young people, we blame the parents, but it's us, it is society that is creating the issues already. And I think we do need to look at that. We do need to see that many of the young people that Pat is dealing with, and that other detention sy systems around the, the EU are dealing with, they're picking up the problems of our society and that's where kids are being dumped, and they are being dumped into the criminal justice system. Thank you, Pat. And in case people haven't seen it, I think, sorry, Don, um, the, I think it was the Howard League who published a report on the criminalization of children in alternative care. So, for example, if a child in residential care behaved badly, uh, the response was to call the police. That doesn't happen when a child behaves badly in their home. So very disproportionate responses and of course it escalates from there and goes downhill. So thank you for that. Who else would like to take the floor? If there's nobody else, uh, does anybody want, from the panel want to address any of the questions on silence or just to take them with them to the forum? I don't know if you... Um, so I just, uh, I suppose, two observations. Um, I think the point that Don raised in relation to the system, I think, is, is crucial, uh, and we do need to take that away um, in our considerations for the future um, because we've created the systems that are there, we can change the systems that are there, but it's determining what that change should look like. And there are competing demands when you create a system. Um, there's competing demands when you go to alter it. Um, and those demands relate to children's rights, relate to other requirements, legislative requirements, um, and different countries will have different expectations. So I think it's a, it's a complicated piece, um, and it, it does need serious consideration. I think um, the point that Barry um, raised in relation to silence, I think is, again, um, I think it's appropriate. It's um, a valid point. I think there's also um, consideration has been given to responsibilities within ensuring that when you look to raise issues, um, whether it is around, um, you know, we go and we, we, we talk to children, the fact that we talk to children doesn't resolve the issue. It's how we address the particular issues with children um, and how we can make those changes are important. Um, there's reference relating to the political silence. I mean, some of these uh, challenges exist because, again, go back to the point that systems are in place and it's not that easy to come up with solutions, but there's an expectation that we change, we make it better. So it's forums like this where the shared information, shared understanding will allow those options to be considered. Just, just to add and put to that, um, one of the things that's interesting about the directive is that for jurisdictional reasons, uh, for competence reasons, the EU can act where there's criminal proceedings in place. So the directive applies where children are involved in criminal proceedings. Now in some countries, um, it, they're not defined as criminal proceedings even though you can send a child to detention. So in theory, the directive won't apply uh, completely. There are arguments against that, though, because you might look to the nature of what's happening rather than how it's labelled. But just to say, even though it applies to criminal proceedings, you have suddenly this article which requires you to look at what protective measures might be necessary in the context of a criminal proceeding. So it's really interesting to think about what that means. I mean, going back to the issue, is it a false dichotomy between child protection and criminal proceedings. In a way, Article 7 does bring them together. We have that potential. It should happen. Of course it should happen. But we have the systems in place that sometimes prevent that from happening, things happening in silos. 
So we've seen some really good practical things that can happen, like joint training of lawyers and police. I think of a situation where a trafficked child has been convicted, found in a cannabis farm in the UK, and being exploited in this um, cannabis farm, but found by the police, arrested, convicted, and sent to jail before finally being identified as trafficked, and then before finally being released. And sometimes in that instance, you'll have the criminal court recognizing that, no, we're not dealing with a, 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 a convict or an offender, we're dealing with a, someone who has been trafficked. But yet, the criminal court releases the child, because that's all they can do in some jurisdictions, and they don't follow up with what should happen to the child then. So the child simply falls back into the hands of traffickers. So what are the options for courts? And what do we need to make that change? Sometimes it's law. Sometimes it can be done in practice. So it's really important to think about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you to those of you who provided feedback on the first uh, half of the side event. With regard to drawing parallels, uh, we did try to hint towards that in the background paper, and we hope that all of you now feel you're in a position to draw parallels yourself and to do that in the forum over the next two days and beyond. I'd like to ask Ursula to um, make some concluding remarks and to wish us all very fruitful and useful forum discussions and beyond. There's a lot to be done, but you're here and we can get there. Thanks, Margaret. I'm conscious I'm standing between you all and lunch, so I'll be brief. Um, we started yesterday afternoon with um, Laura Lundy's presentation on voice, and I think we have addressed uh, not just that voice is not enough, but also that, that we need to uh, give visibility also to the whole range and complexity of issues that um, have uh, that we have touched on over the last um, 24 hours right across the spectrum um, of concerns relating to children deprived of their liberty and the need for greater focus on alternatives. Um, and I think uh, what was clear from all of the presentations throughout the, the, the uh, sessions was the importance uh, of testimony, both individual testimony and expertise and expert testimony. Um, that is a source of great um, power in its, in, in its information and, um, and expertise. So thank you to everybody who contributed to that knowledge. Um, we have learned, obviously, uh, further detail and understanding about how awful detention can be for children, and we've discussed its impacts in lots of different ways. Um, and, and considered also how, in many ways also, it makes no sense uh, it makes no sense for children, uh, for their families, for society, and economically. Um, but we also um, heard about reform and the need for change. Um, and I think, in particular, focusing on that metaphor of building the scaffolding, uh, uh, not the cage, as a hugely important child rights approach to these issues. Um, what is important, and I suppose what informed uh, the work that Margaret did in putting together is this, the programme of the side event. Um, what's important is an understanding uh, among this group of the circumstances of young people deprived of their liberty, an understanding of how to advocate for change in those circumstances and conditions and practices, and um, a commitment to effect that change politically, academically in your practice, however possible that is to do it. We all try to do it in lots of different ways. Um, many of us on the outside, some of us on the inside, and it's uh, the extent of that challenge, as, as Don has articulated, I think should not be ever underestimated. What we're trying to do is break what is often an ingrained um, systemic approach to these issues. So the challenge of that from whatever your perspective, should never be underestimated. Um, but it is really important that there is, following this event, um, great cohesion and a sense of shared purpose about the importance of change and how we go about um, affecting it together. Um, and I suppose the final 
point I would make around that relating to the, the importance of the evidence base uh, is to reiterate again the importance of the global study. It's a hugely important part of how we can build momentum internationally um, at a time when uh, certainly uh, the rates of detention of children in some contexts in some countries is falling, but we see an extraordinary um, a use of detention in the context of immigration um, with all of the, the impacts that that will have, uh, not just on children, but on uh, their families and on, in fact, their, their countries. So it's a hugely important um, uh, lesson or I suppose uh, important message to leave here from is that support for global study should not be taken for granted. It is a really important um, commitment to creating that evidence base and building further momentum so we can advocate for the kind of change that we know uh, young people are entitled to. So um, thanks for all the, the um, presentations and in particular to Margaret for her expert chairing. Thank you Ursula. Um, just a word before you go for lunch which is on the first floor. The forum, as you know, starts at half past two. Every single chair in this room will be full. So if you could gather up your things, uh, please don't leave odd um, chairs empty between you because for people coming in afterwards, it'll be more difficult to find a seat. Just be aware every chair is needed, no bags, no coats lying around. Uh, we'll start promptly at half past two and you have a very full program over the next day and a half. Thank you all for your participation and have a good lunch.